And now the AM News in detail. Ranking member on the Energy Committee in Parliament, John Ginapo, has warned against peddling of falsehood as the committee prepares to meet the Energy Minister, Dr. Matthew Pukupempe, and other players in the energy sector. The meeting, which is scheduled for this weekend, will afford the committee to demand answers to the current doomsaw situations experienced across the country. But ahead of that meeting, John Ginapo says the parties must be ready to tell Ghanaians the true state of affairs. Well, what beats my imagination is how government needs communicators who think that they can take all of us on that ride. I mean, it really, really beats my imagination that like 30 million Ghanaians you think that you can just yeah. take us on this ride with this flimsy excuse of so-called transformer overloads. When transformers are overloaded, it means that yeah, there isn't enough supply there's too much supply of power so why are we not curtailing supply of power to our neighboring countries more importantly now the official document from Greco on their letterhead authenticated document establishes that we've been shedding load because of fuel challenges all this while when we said there's fuel there's fuel problem a lot of people said we didn't know what we're talking about we're naysayers why do we wish bad for this country? Why are we calling for a load shedding table? They knew, they knew. Because there's a weekly report from Gridco to the minister. And all the weekly reports I see confirms that there's a deficit in generation, primarily because of fuel challenges. What we need is to find a way as a country collectively to procure adequate fuel for the plant. And I would make a proposal to chairman that the media should be invited. I would make a proposal to chairman that the media should be invited. This is a serious matter. This is the burning issue now. Industry complaining, households are complaining, commercial entities are complaining. There is a clear uncertainty. Nobody wants to speak to the issue. The president is quiet. The vice president, who chairs the cash waterfall mechanism and head of economic management team, is quiet. The minister is being dismissive. And, and, I mean, you just don't see leadership. And so MPs, we are struggling and doing everything we can to bring these agencies. And we don't have that much sway on them as compared to the executive. But the president can fire these heads of these agencies within the twinkle of an eye. MPs is going to take a daunting task. And even when you want to censure ministers, you saw what, what happened on the floor. They will do our best. They will, first of all, even honor the invitation and hope that they'll be honest. Now, Joy News can authoritatively report that a police inspector accused of using a service rifle to kill his girlfriend at a doom in Kumase is alive and healthy. Social media reports have alleged that, alleged that the death of Inspector Ahmed Chumisi, also known as Tycoon, who has been in prison remand since his arrest last year. But Oheming Tewia of our security desk, who was given exclusive access to the remand police officer, reports he is hail and Haiti as the prison authorities begin investigations into the fake reports. Inspector Ahmed Chumesi has been on remand since his arrest in May 2023 after a specialized police operation led to his arrest in his hideout at Setre near Efijasi in the Ashanti region. He has been accused of shooting 26-year-old Victoria Dapa, also known as Majwa, multiple times in the abdomen and chest on April 20, 2023 at about 9.50 p.m., though he is expected to appear before a Kumasi High Court on April 15, 2024. Rumors about his death spread on social media. The authorities of Kumasi Central Prisons granted me access to the cells of the accused. Sporting a white t-shirt over a pair of khaki shorts and slippers, he responded to questions from prison officers. He was hale and hearty. Inspector Ahmed Chumesi told the officers in my presence that he was privy to rumors of his death. Here is the public relations officer of the Kumasi Central Prisons, Superintendent Richard Bukari. Categorically not true. I emphatically say it is not true. I'm a Chumesi is hale and hearty in custody. Nothing has happened to him and I promise nothing 
will happen to him. Uh, I took the pain to walk yourself through the prison to have a look at him. And looking at him, he's not even sick. And I wonder under what circumstances Chumasi will be declared uh, dead. Even for natural causes, we don't pray for it. But as professional as the prisons have been, uh, taking note that he's a state property, we will not do anything that will compromise his health, his security, and his well-being in the prisons. So I say on authority that Chumasi is not dead, he's alive, healthy, and undergoing his trial processes. Appalled by the circulation of the fake news, prison authorities have launched investigations to get to the bottom of the issue and punish the culprits. Superintendent Bukhari again. Anybody involved in circulating such information should be very careful. After all, it is even against the laws of the state to circulate false information. It is a chargeable offense and you can be imprisoned for it. But we are not leaving it just there. We are going further to investigate the source of that info. Whoever would have generated such false information that is causing this upheaval in the general public will have to be dealt with according to the laws of Ghana. He's just not denting the image of the prison service, but he's creating unnecessary fear and panic in the nation, which is not too good for our development, considering how far we have come. The prisons all this while has been very professional in handling uh, issues of public interest of this nature. And we promise that we aren't going to compromise on our standards. Meanwhile, Inspector Chumasi is expected to appear at the Kumase High Court on April 15, 2024. From Kumase, for Joy News, Wahim Interior reporting. From Kumasi, let's now come back to Accra in Agbogbloshi. Traders combine efforts to tidy up the markets instead of relying solely on government assistance to deal with incessant filth menace. Evidently, after a rainy Wednesday morning, the market area was clean, yet choked gutters remain a concern. I bring you today's episode of Filth Exhibition for Magbubloshi, highlighting the traders' proactive efforts and the work that still remain. This is Agbubloshi. It's just about five hours after a heavy rainpour. And we came to the market to assess the sanitation situation in Agbubloshi. But upon entering the market, we realized that the market looked clean. For a second there, we thought that the impact of our Joy New series field exhibition perhaps had to cost our leaders to clean up the city a little bit. So we went out to ask the market women, what really accounts for the cleanliness we see? Now is a market woman here in Agbobloshi. Why is the town clean today? Uh, today because of the rain, that's why. And Wednesday, Wednesday no market. But tomorrow, Thursday, we have Agbobloshi market here. Okay. The cabbage peoples and all the peoples will come on this area. But today, no market. But who cleans the market? What was the last time you saw AMA, Zoom Lion, anybody? Do they come and clean here? Yes, AMA people. Yes. They used to come here on once in the while, months. Actually, first time when the rain is falling, you will see this side is not nice. Okay. But because of I don't, I don't coastal, okay. they come and do some coastal here. Okay. That's why they make yes clean. Okay. They make this place clean. So the people, they are Doom Coastal people, they are the ones who made the, who clean up the market. Uh, and the market woman too. We gather and pay 70 each. We the sellers here, we gather to pay 70, 70. And I don't propose to help us to do it. Okay. To do. So you clean the market yourselves and not the AMA who comes to clean the market? No, 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 no not the AMA. So just a few meters from where Nas spoke to us, let's now engage Kenneth. In this area, for instance, we have these uh, Radiadum Coastal. They are the ones who actually wanted, wanting to sell 
they are aware here. So they came to prepare, put some sand and some gravels and all those things. And now today, our market is looking very good. At the moment, it's not our intention to say the market looks good. It's not that bad anyway, uh, because for their sake, today our market looks very good. As to the cleanup exercise, normally what happens is we normally do it periodically. It, can, it could happen on Saturday, it could happen on uh, uh, Monday, or any, any day it falls. And we engage the AMA because they, they will see to it that we do that until 10 o'clock before we all resume work. That is when the cleanup exercise is ongoing. You know, the market is meant for us and we are in it. So definitely we have to make sure we put our hands together and join our hands together before we could do anything here. You understand what I'm saying? As a cleanup exercise, is, just, is it just surface? Because although it looks on the surface that like the market is clean, a deeper look, like into the gutter where we are standing, reveals lots of filth still. Who's responsible for taking care of this? There are some issues that, that need to be addressed, like the gutters. Our gutters need to be covered, you understand. And moreover, if they are not, and the reason is if they are not covered, a lot of filth enter. You know, rubbers all over, pure water rubber, and a whole lot. People are throwing maggi rubbers everywhere. And you can see even uh, cabbage. They are even peeling off cabbage and all that. Anything could enter the gutter when it's not covered. And, in, in it, and, the, and the AMA is also not supporting. Because um, people are using pallets, that's why I said it, it boils down to market centers. There should, have, there should be a market center where everybody could sit. Uh, there, there should be lots where everybody could sit so that they will leave the road to be free, so that the gutters can be free. That's what it is. But if that thing is not happening, then there's no way our gutters will be free. Regardless of how it looks on the surface, a second look at the gutters where the market's women sit on the roads reveal that the gutters are choked and there's still more work to be done. So we caught up with the queen mother of the market, Mabel, and this is what she had to say. Is it a case that every month AMA actually comes to clean the markets for you? And yet every month. It was three days today, any on my meeting. Say where you got them. It's a member two anka yes where you anka. Friday where you got them. It appears these traders have taken it upon themselves to clean their environment because government is not really helping the situation. How do we move forward from the sanitation crisis? Maybe you have the answers. For Joy News, I'm Sweetie Habochi. That was today's episode of Filth Exhibition, a Joy News series. Now moving on, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament, Andy Apiakubi, is clashing with his ranking member over the recently announced hike in passport application fees. Andy Apiakubi describes the concern expressed by Samuel Okujetua Blakwa regarding the hike in fees as tantrums. The minority spokesperson on foreign affairs told Joy News while he was not opposed to the increase in fees in principle, he was not in support of the magnitude of the increase. Well, uh, not uh, bode well for our country. The timing is bad. We have uh, unprecedented economic crisis. Uh, inflation has gone through the roof. Um, uh, you know that the general living conditions are terrible. We have a cost of living crisis. This cannot be the time uh, to do this. So we, we made our views uh, very, very clear uh, to them. Uh, what happened subsequently is that uh, they uh, went ahead and this um, uh, was added to the general fees and charges. Uh, but we insisted that even if this is where they want to get to, it could be done in a graduated manner. Uh, because what the foreign minister admitted is that uh, they had not touched the 
passport fees for a long time, for many years. So I said that, look, you you don't um, virtually uh, derelict for this long, and then suddenly you wake up, say that uh, it is the lowest in the sub-region, and so you want to slap such a high percentage. And so let it be graduated. That was the advice we had for them. That is why we suggested that let it be graduated, because if you look at other countries uh, who left us behind, it was being done gradually, and they didn't even achieve that increment during periods of economic crisis, not when we are going through financial haircuts, we are desperate for an IMF bailout and all of that. So I am deeply disappointed that the ministry did not take our advice and has just done one full swoop at a go, just imposing this high increment yeah, but, on, but the, on, on, on the suffering. But, 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 but this was subject to parliamentary up. This was subject to parliamentary approval. Is there any possibly any last-minute intervention that might come through from your office or perhaps the minority side on the Foreign Affairs Court? When, when the House resumes, we intend to revisit this matter because uh, my recommendation, I believe, that is sound. Uh, our uh, committee was clear that this should not be done uh, in one uh, single swoop. But reacting to these comments at a news conference yesterday, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Andy Apiakubi, argued that Okujeto Ablakwe's stance was without basis as the decision to approve the proposed fees was unanimous in the NDC-led subsidiary legislation committee. For anybody to step out to say that they vehemently opposed the review of the fee is uh, neither here nor there. And the person who is throwing those tantrums is not a member of that committee. And indeed, it was not the work of the Foreign Affairs Committee, which I chair, which he is a ranking. So this is the work of the subsidiary legislation committee and indeed chaired by the I, uh, NDC uh, member of parliament. So it never occurred in the committee meeting that there was protestation as to the uh, recommendation for review. So it was a unanimous decision taken by the committee. It's amazing uh, how Ghanaians want us to be political all the time. And that people are saying it is election year and therefore, we don't have to. It is a lesson here. Let us not forget that it is your money. It is your own money that could otherwise give you something else for the benefit of the whole, rather than for the benefit of only a segment of society. So although it is um, a lesson here, it is important for us to be prudent in the use of public resources. Again, the same people who complain of the increase are the same people who are buying tickets for use uh, every now and again as they travel. And they are paying $2,000 plus for one trip. They, you cannot travel without the passport, even though you may have the money to pay for the $2,000 plus. So the best document that gives you the opportunity to travel is only 500 Ghana cities. In other stories, Kenya's president, President William Ruto, has described the current setup of the African Union as dysfunctional, adding that there's little accountability in the structures of the union. The leader of the East African country, who is paying a state visit to Ghana, revealed yesterday that he's had close talks with Ghana's president, Ekufuado, on the need to reform the African Union and its institutions to transform the continent. As part of his activities for the day, William Ruto delivered a public lecture at the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area in Accra, where he strongly argued or urged Africans to join hands in changing the narrative of an Africa inflicted with poverty and low level of development. There's more in this report. A rousing welcome for Kenya's president, Dr. William Ruto, who was on a state visit to the Republic of Ghana. The East African leader, as part of his activities, delivered a lecture at the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area. 
Secretary General of the Continental Body, Wam Kele Mene, in his address to the gathering, pointed out how pivotal the African continental free trade area is and plans to turn around the fortunes of the continent using the African continental free trade area. Of course, much remains to be done to make sure that we all realize the ambitions and the goals of the AFCFTA. It presents an unprecedented opportunity for our continent to continue, to continue to break the legacy of colonialism. That effort to break the legacy of colonialism, as we all know, started in May 1963 in Addis Ababa at the formation of the Organization of African Unity. We are therefore well poised, a continent of 1.4 billion people, with a combined GDP that is projected by the year 2050 to be close to 16.2 trillion United States dollars, we're well poised to be a single market that is globally competitive, that has advanced industrial development capabilities, that has food security to feed herself by eliminating barriers to trade in Taking his stand to address the gathering, Kenya's President William Ruto called for reforms in the global financial architecture while leaving no stone unturned in also calling for accountability and reforms within the African Union. President Nana Kufuado told us this morning some significant statistics that intra-European trade is all the way to 73-75%. Intra-African trade is down at 12, maybe 14, maybe 15%. And it speaks volumes of not where we are, but the potential that exists for us to grow our trade. It is important for us if we have to have an African Union that works for the people of our continent, it must be accountable and there must be a mechanism to adjudicate, a court to adjudicate on matters that affect our organization. The African continental free trade area has been described as the last opportunity for the continent to transform and to turn around its economic fortunes. After today's lecture, there is a common resolve by all actors to trade more amongst African countries and to boost economic growth across the continent. That is very, very key because in all this trade, there's the need to have a stabilized financial system. And also, it was a good occasion to hear from uh, His Excellency Mene Wamkele talk about the next phase, the next direction, and also to meet captains of industry here to listen. And I know what His Excellency Ruto said, he's going to do it. I have also confidence in the continental free trade when they assured that they are expecting about 10 billion in the Afriism Bank. That is the essence. If you're able to um, uh, give resources to the Afriism Bank, so that they use it as an onward um, credit to the uh, trading populace. Then, of course, the attraction also comes. Bless us again reporting for Joy News, Trade House, Accra. Right, so that will be all for the AM News. Up next is the News Review, and then the conversation starts. You still want to stick with us from now till 10 AM. <laughs> Welcome back on the AM show and of course it's time now for the news review. Very quickly before I get into the guest that we have joining the conversation and of course a Sweetie Abochi in the studio and Point Homeopathic Clinic helping us bring you this segment as always. And uh, they're offering you, if you're a man, prostate screening for free. If you're a woman, fertility screening uh, for free. All you have to do is reach out to them at any of their branches and thankfully they are all over the country starting with the craft spintex opposite the shell signboard kumasi 
Kronu Mabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takradi Anaji State, Tema Community 22, Techiman Hansua, and Esiaman Zama. Their call lines 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. But just to start of the news review and uh, my partner in not in crime but in good things Sweetie Abochi is here and we're also joined by the general secretary of the PPP Remy Edmondson good morning sir good morning so we have a bit of a tradition here usually hosting our guests on news review we give them about a minute or a minute and a half to talk about any issue burning issue that they'd like to. What, what will you choose to reflect on today? I mean, there's no shortage of issues. Which one would you reflect on? Okay, current or generally? <laughs> it, it can be current, it can be uh, general. Okay. okay, that's fine. Uh, thank you. So, um, I think I would want to uh, touch on the uh, issue of the SML. Uh, SML? Yeah, scandal. Mm. I think, um, in fact, it's quite unfortunate that uh, this government came in on the road into uh, power primarily on the, on the promise of eradicating and fighting corruption, uh, mm. protecting the public purse. But we're unfortunately, for the past, since 2017, we've been inundated with one corruption, corruption scandal after the other. And it appears currently, rather unfortunately, the president seems to have given up on the fight. Because uh, literally not a week or two goes by without one new scandal or the other popping up. And um, I read recently the, um, the report has been received. That's the audit report from KPMG as received by the president. And, for me, this issue has rather taken so long for the president to deal with decisively and put to rest uh, the issue once and for all because it's been more than three months since uh, the media broke the story about these uh, uh, allegations of impropriety and corruption about this issue. And though the, the, the government gave out this contract, we felt there were state institutions that were mandated had the capacity uh, to have uh, undertaken this, this uh, audit. Nevertheless, we urged the president to speedily uh, put out the audit reports publicly so that we all get to know what the findings are and uh, where there's any malfeasance has been uh, uncovered, the necessary steps will be remedied. If any refunds should be made, it should be done. If any prosecution should be uh, undertaken, it should be done to serve as a deterrent uh, to other public institutions. Because as I said, the state is bleeding so much. We lose so much uh, money due to corruption. And mind you, most of these monies are loans that the government contracted right. from uh, external agencies, which we will have to pay for uh, in some years to come. So it's not really like free money or grants that is being dissipated, but money is you and I, and our kids probably, are going to have to pay back. And if they are dissipated in this one thing manner, then it doesn't go well for our future as a country. It doesn't. And uh, we know uh, as of now, everyone is waiting to see the details of that KPMG report, right. which right. Uh, purportedly is with uh, the presidency, right. purportedly. And uh, if it is, the question is, why is it taking so long exactly. to let us know what the yeah. contents right. of Because of the, longer then, as that said, the longer it takes then, ah. um, already then there'll be allegations or rumors of trying to cover up. Speculation. Exactly. And I mean, it's, it's natural to think this way yeah, once the delay goes on. Well, I think uh, just uh, yesterday I had an interaction with uh, Professor Kwabna from Pong uh, Boateng. And he said that in the fight against corruption, in fact, the fight hadn't even started. <laughs> <laughs> that for him, that is th 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 there's not been a fight. The fight has not even started. started and yeah. that Eku Fuadu has, has, when it comes to corruption, right. he, he has nothing uh, to it's, show. It's, you would notice that at the State of the Nation address, the president avoided zero anything. He didn't even mention the word corruption anymore. I mean, you go, we, go, we really go on in studios with um, members, or communication members, and I sometimes pity them because it's an uphill task trying to defend some of these issues. Nobody is able to really speak to it. Immediately the issue comes up, they have to divert to another issue and completely avoid it because... It's the elephant in the room, yes. even if I have to play it's, Like I said, it's, 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 it's so per pervasive and uh, seemingly nothing is being done about it. So it, it seems to appear that there's some complicity. That is, I mean, where, where, from where I sit, as I see, due to the failure of the president to decisively deal with these issues. All right. So we have a stack of papers. I have uh, the Daily Graphic and Daybreak. Uh, what do you have there? Uh, so the Daily Guide. Daily Guide and then uh, the, the Daily, Daily Statesman. Statesman. Yes. And I have has the Ghanaian Times newspaper and the New Finder. They say ladies newspaper. first. So how about you <laughs> kickstart this for us? Oh, I've already mentioned okay. Daily Graphic and right. Daybreak newspaper. Great. So let's start from the Ghanaian Times newspaper. On the front page of the Ghanaian Times newspaper, 
The headline, Use AFCFTA to Boost Trade, African Businesses Told, Majority Caucus Defense Passport Fee Hikes, Sign Eight MOUs as Part of President Ruto's Three-Day Visit, and GTC Bans Noisemaking in Ghana State, May 6th. Um, June, May 6th to June 6th, Muslims mark night of power. I want to do the story about the majority caucus defending the passport hike fees right. because this has been going on for, I yes. think, three days now. And the story is on page nine of the newspaper and reads, the majority caucus in parliament has defended the hike in passport application fees and called on Ghanaians to support the increment to make the passport application process efficient. The caucus said the increment was a decision by the entire house and at no point in time was there an objection to the hike. So chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee and MP for Asante Achim North, Andy Apiakubi, told journalists in Accra yesterday that the increment was long overdue. So where, what are the facts of this issue? I still want to reference Honorable Okuje Tuablakwa's comment that they have not received the figures they, didn't, they weren't consulted as uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee, member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, they, have not, they are not abreast with this hike in passport prices. And then they won't <coughs> even escalate in an attempt to reassess the fees and uh, try and make it more affordable for Ghanaians. What do you think on this issue? Well, uh, that's surprising because uh, his first comment, that's uh, Honorable Kujab mm. but the very first comments he passed on this issue, um, was that to the fact that when the, um, the issue came before them at the committee level, mm. they advocated for a, a gradual increment in the, mm. in the fees, yes, uh, but not uh, uh, by such a substantial yeah. percentage, yes. Uh, I mean, that is what I, I, I read online, but mm. attributed to him. And um, I mean, personally, I also feel that, just like other Ghanaians feel, that this, these hikes are just way too much. I agree. I think sometime last year, the Minister Honorable Mm. made the case for why they needed to increase. She called it realistic. She said yes, it and realistic. I mean, she gave us some figures of how much they were spending and mm. indicated that the government was subsidizing, but I think by 200 CDs each booklet they printed. And uh, I know this fees, it's been 100 CDs for like, at least since 2018, when I did my first biometric passport, it's been like that. So I agree that between that time and now, it's been about six years, mm. at least, yes. There have been, uh, I mean, increases in generally in the price of goods and commodities. Yeah. So yes, it's, it's just what... Uh, to the extent that from 100 cities to uh, 500 cities minimum, I think it's just way beyond what the ordinary Ghanaian can afford. But what is quite disappointing for me is the comments that have come from the majority. Ma uh, yeah, yeah. And then also the sector minister herself. Mm. That uh, I mean, I find them to be a bit, to be a bit insensitive to the plan of the ordinary Ghanaian because. Uh, and also to say that I find it. Which, which comments exactly? Because yeah, that's, I, was, that's, I was about to mention what the deputy minister, maybe I should just go ahead. I listened to a conversation okay. where. He made mention of the fact that yeah. there was hypocrisy on the other side, that is okay. the NDC side, because at the committee level, everybody, when these came up in Parliament, at the committee level, the Foreign Affairs Committee, everyone had actually subscribed to yeah. the increments. Sure. And that uh, he finds it, in fact, he went as far as saying that um, Okujatwa Blakwa, the North Tong legislator, was an expert at, what word did he use? Um, suggesting milking a situation for propaganda, I, because I can't remember the okay. exact wording he used. So then you have to ask yourself as well, Okuja just speaks to, to us, yeah. and he says he had no knowledge of, he has no knowledge of what the goes figures. into these increments, yeah. the real figures and yeah. all of that. The deputy minister says the committee ensemble knew what was going on and that they had in fact subscribed to it. So you then begin to wonder, who is telling the truth? And then you look at the backlog of passports, for example, where you have over 70,000, and per day, you are having a backlog of about three to 4,000. Yeah. Multiply that per month and all of it. So you see the knock-on effect. Sure. In the end, while we talk about the, the figures, how much is involved, because right now the economy is in tatters. Yeah. People can't, that's, that's one end. But we also ought to look at the realistic end of what goes into this. How are things being done? They complain about machinery breaking down, mm. which also means that this backlog, there are people who, I think he said, if you applied now, the earliest you would get for any sort of 
is December, and yes. some people will start going into next year. So That's we must look at the reality of it and the inconvenience right. of, of the situation. And how so, they, perhaps governments can so absorb I, some... Like I said, I agree with that perfectly. I mean, uh, practically, I happen to be, uh, be in a position to be... I normally assist people with this particular service. And yes, in Accra, for example, we're going to book today. Your earliest interview date will probably be November. Mm. And it's going to take about some four to five months before the booklet can be printed for you. So I very much agree that there are challenges with that. And they need... As I said, I agree with her session that they needed to... Uh, I mean make some increments to stop the losses and the subsidies. But I said, um, this is something, as a sector minister, as a government, you see, your utterances matter. And I was, about the comment I was talking about, you know, saying things like um, passports are not a privilege and that uh, if you don't need one, move on. You see, it is not everybody. And then saying things like you only, uh, you should get it only when you, ha you are going to travel. And now the Ghana card suffices. And here's a case where, like I said, there's such a long delay. It's going to take, if you're applying in Accra, it's going to take you a minimum eight months to get it. It's possible perhaps as a business person or maybe as a student, some opportunity, travel opportunity might come up in the next two, three months. You cannot wait until an emergency time. Now, people are paying something around 1,005. This is a reality. Mm -hmm. People are paying between 1,005 to 2,000 CDs uh, to middlemen to, to fast track, to, to fast -track process. uh, uh, processes for them. You understand? In the case where they need the password urgently. So uh, we need to look at the two issues well. And like I said, a gradual increment, in my opinion, mm -hmm. let's not punish, let's not look at the fact that uh, many people need it, have, have left it too late. And need it desperately and are paying so much. Let's not punish the ordinary Ghanaian because I think this is a document that every Ghanaian deserves and should be able to afford. But, right. but I've also heard someone say, I believe, well, I don't know whether it was, and I'm being careful here, I don't know whether it was, I, I heard someone, I'll, I'll clarify, right. uh, say that it's a privilege, not a right. I'll, exactly. I, will, I will look for Exactly. I, uh, that was one of the things I mean. That was one of the statements I felt was, was quite unfortunate. It's, it's a privilege, it have not a right. I mean, there are constitutionally, there are some things that you deserve, but there are other things to be done. But I find such rhetoric a bit elitist and a bit detached exactly. from the reality. Perfect. Because every Ghanaian, even the child, I remember way back in time, way, way, way back, when I, I would travel on my parents' passports and all, it was so, and now all of, <laughs> but anyway, let's, yes. let's, let's leave it there. Yes. I may say I, things that... Yeah. <laughs> I just wonder if this, the backlog is actually an infrastructure deficit or challenge, or if it's just the human resources, they're taking their good time to make... Because if you can pay more money and get your passport faster than the regular processes, yes. then it means that it's possible to get it within the shortest possible time, is it not? But let's move on. The story on the AFCFTA is on page 8 of... Uh, the Ghanaian Times newspaper, and it reads, businesses in Ghana and Kenya have been urged to leverage investment opportunities in both countries offered under the African Continental Free Trade Area to boost economic trade. According to speakers at the Made in Ghana Kenya Business Forum, the AFCFTA and other structures such as the establishment of a Ghana trade house in Kenya offered huge prospects for both countries. Areas of possible collaboration proposed at the event included agriculture, manufacturing, tourism, information technology, telecom, banking, insurance, and the energy sectors. Benjamin, are you familiar with this story? I think it comes at the back of President Ruto's visit to Ghana and him urging Ghanaians to take advantage of the AFCFTA um, I agreement. Mean, the AFTA is headquartered here. Mm. Uh, as of now, the AFTA has yielded nothing for us. That's the reality. Really? It, it hasn't given us even one out of a hundred. And the reality is having the after here is a good thing, mm -hmm. but it's one thing having it here. It's another thing tapping into it and maximizing it. Many African countries have not got to the point where they are making the most of it, but some are already. Which we have it here. We, we have not okay. um, activated what it takes. And some have even said that it could be an onslaught against us. Imagine Nigeria, their production capacities and everything. This creates a certain market and if we are not careful, just as the Chinese have done globally, the Nigerians and South Africans will do to us and we'll be seeing, oh, after, after. But the, the, the question is, what, what are you getting from it? So this after conversation, mm. it's an interesting one, but some countries are far ahead of us and Kenya itself yeah. is ahead of us in that in that regard okay yes and uh, i mean to add to that i've realized that uh, in fact 
we many businesses still do not. I mean, education ha, for, has been quite low on that. Uh, on the, I mean, the African Continental Free Trade mm. Act. Yes, there are still several businesses who still have no idea. I'm very much aware. Yes, some uh, private entities are, 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 are stepping up efforts. Uh, with the engagement education on that. But I think it's first of all to take advantage of that, like he's saying, we need to, businesses do be know what this holds for them and how, most importantly, they can also exploit the opportunities available. Um, on the matter of how best we can also um, uh, benefit from this, uh, I, I believe that's where our trade policies will have to come in because the purpose of one of the purpose of this is to ensure that we get to trade much more within ourselves as a continent. Currently, we are trading more with the West. Mm. And uh, I mean, uh, if, if Ghana is able to get the business from maybe South Africa or some other African countries, it's going to boost uh, our forex earnings. And so um, our manufacturing sectors, our agro processing sectors and uh, trade sectors, if we're able to trade within African countries, I know for a fact that, I mean, exporting to the West, there are some uh, inhibitions, some rules that some of our exporters are not able to meet. But at least if we're able to, uh, what AFTA seeks to do is to uh, reduce some tariffs and then ensure that there's a level playing field for our African countries. And I think if we plan very well for it, we can utilize it very well and benefit. Right. Let me do the, uh, find a newspaper now, and then I'll come to one of you gentlemen <laughs> for your stories. The story um, here about Dr. Balmia cutting sword for 200-bed hostel for Trinity Theology Seminary. Vice President Dr. Mahmoudou Balmia has cut sword for the construction of four-story 200-bed hostel facility for the Trinity Theological Seminary in Accra, the multi-purpose hostel, which is being funded by the Ghana Education Trust Fund, is in fulfillment of a pledge Dr. Baumia made to the seminary following a request by the college for assistance during its 2022 congregation, which Dr. Baumia graced. It looks like there's a lot of sword cutting and launching going. Do you have any reaction and, to this And, and, and <laughs> attempts at fulfilling promises, yeah. some of which were made seven years ago. All of Decades a sudden, ago. All of a sudden. <laughs> I mean, we are, we're in election year, yeah. and things are heating up very much. So, yes, I mean, we should expect to see a lot more uh, projects that are uh, shortcutting for projects, mm. which most likely will not even be completed. Uh, because it's often done as uh, election gimmicks to give the semblance of uh, having the people at heart and then wanting to start some project in their interest. Right. Let me just do some headlines and then I'll come to you, Benjamin. Free SHS students exempt from paying WASI registration fees. President Parliament moved to tackle Doomso. I do not know for sure if they are actually trying to tackle Doomso. Police officer jailed 12 years for defiling 14-year-old girl. And um, 66 irregular migrants arrested in Western Region. Those are some of the headlines in the New Finder newspaper. Let's do the Daily Graphic newspaper now. Ghana's democracy inspires Africa. President Ruto says so. Uh, there's uh, Kenyan President Dr. William uh, Samoy Arap Ruto, who has described Ghana's democracy as a beacon of hope and an inspiration to many countries, especially with the emergence of unconstitutional governments from all directions. He explained that Kenya was proud of Ghana's democracy, particularly the almost equal members of parliament for both the minority and majority, which he said demonstrated the level of maturity of Ghana's democracy and the extent mm. to which it was entrenched. It's always good having, let me say, foreigners come into the country. And it's, it's good because they have a cosmetic um, feel of what Ghana is. Right. You know, until you go to a place like Rwanda, right. you, do, you oh, Pokagami this, and the environment is this. Until you get there, then you can form your own opinion, right? Um, Ghana is not faring terribly when it comes to democracy. But when I, I would al always ask, what is democracy? It's been succinctly defined as rule of the people, by the people, for the people. Okay, is it really by the people? Uh, looking at our elections and the way money has infiltrated it, is it of the people? Well, you could say, yes, they are Ghanaians, right? But is it for? Mm. <laughs> the, the end, you know, that one. <laughs> Uh, that's, I don't that's, know, that's, but that's, um, that's quite deep. But at least I think, are, Ghana, we've enjoyed some um, peace and stability in terms of democracy since I think Jerry John Rollins handed over power peacefully. We haven't sure. had anything that's really threatened the peace we enjoy democratically. Yes. We've, we've had a lot of seeming tensions, that's a fact. And I know Ghana keeps being cited uh, by the West and other African yeah. countries, yes, for our democracy. But I, I, I still feel that somehow we are sitting on a time bone. Well, because, uh, yeah, citing uh, Benjamin's uh, earlier remarks, I mean, um, 
we're getting to a point where um, we, I, uh, with this winner takes all politics that we practice. I feel it's not healthy for our democracy. I think we need to start looking at uh, a, a, a period of self-governance because it's, it's uh, ask yourself why getting to election there are so much violent talks and there's so much violence and threats. Why? Because, uh, what, let, me, let me take a case in time. The NDC currently has been out of power for about close to eight years. I mean, they cannot, there's talk of breaking the eight, the MPP wants to extend it. They can also wait for another eight years to stay in opposition. Mm. And it's because then all the positions, all the contracts are up for grabs are going to go to uh, government functioning political party appointee. So that's, it's important that we look at how we can diffuse some of these things by ensuring that other countries do it, other African countries are doing it. I think we should also learn, be able to say that, okay, President Kofo did that very well. I mean, uh, my party's founder, mm. Dr. Papako Sindum, got the opportunity uh, to serve in his government for all the two terms. And, other, and I know uh, it wasn't just the PPP. There were other uh, minor political parties as well who got the opportunity. So I think that's something we should be looking at going forward. Right. But you know, um, with, as far as President Ruto's uh, flattering comments, uh, you know he's... Uh, Kenya is bidding for the chair of the AU commission. Right. So, so that was one it, thing. It, it's part of It's also part of his uh, campaign <laughs> strategy to yeah. you know, commend us. If, if you know so the undercurrent, sometimes you came to you, ask for our support. You can, you can read between the lines, look yes. at politicians, and realize that uh, what you see may be just 5% of what Very the reality so. is. It's Very like the IMF so. boss and my interaction with her sometime back, and then coming into the country. And oh, I mean, that day when I was interviewing her in the Netherlands, and she said, oh, and Ghana is, and it's all about the exogenous shocks, COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine war. For a moment, <laughs> I had to step outside of my interviewing right. self and be like, say what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was only in my head. Because there were, you know? earlier comments were quite different, you know, and then later on, I was shocked to see the... Uh, if you look at the artif Article 4 statements of the IMF itself, right. you begin asking yourself, but this is politics, sure. whether locally or internationally. Sure. But uh, quickly to move forward from there, there's a story, Nungwa residents divided over alleged child marriage. You followed it. We flogged that horse. Uh, it has to do with a 63-year-old Bobu uh, Wulomo and the 12-year-old girl. Now, some say she's 16. Others say she's 12. Uh, the AG has directed the police to intervene already. I mean, this was after the police had already secured the mother and the child. Uh, some have wondered, I've heard the chieftaincy and religious, uh, religions exactly. minister ask whether there was contact, that is conjugal contact right. between the two of them. And some of this we can also clarify from school, which school does she attend? Right. If she's 12, we expect that she will be at a certain level. If she's sure. 16, we expect that she will be at a certain level. So there's a lot of uh, talk that has gone into that. Yes. And uh, the net right, uh, the network for women's rights in Ghana, uh, which uh, is made up of 179 organizations and over 300 individual mem members, is disappointed with the Nungwa Traditional Council. In fact, Shraj recently in a report said that the highest number of it, the cases that come to it have to do with things that such is, as this, yes. underage marriage, right. forced marriage, young people and all that. So we have a problem. This we, is just we, we, a tip we, of the problem. Yes, and, and, and I'm just hoping that it wouldn't be a usual. You know, Ghana, issues come up like this for three, four days. We flog it, and then everybody drops this and back mm. to business. But there's a, a serious underlying issue, especially uh, when it comes to minors that uh, people take advantage of, especially in the, I mean, the, the same church has made reports as well in the, the coastal areas where uh, the corporates here were the fishermen and learning girls as young as 10 years, 11 years. And this is actually, I mean, if you send your team around, it's actually prevalent. It's an open secret. And unfortunately, because the mothers, the parents are not really taking care of their children, they also en en condone and endorse such activities. So I think it's a, this is just, a, I'm happy it's come out, mm -hmm. but I'm just hoping that as a country and then with the relevant stakeholders, we'll go beyond this and ensure that, yes, the worst things are happening out there. Not to say that we are ignoring this, but there are also worse things happening out there to minors that we yeah. need to uh, tackle. Our social protection mm. uh, policy should be strengthened and then uh, they should be up and doing on some of these issues. Yesterday I had, I had a differing opinion on this matter that although one in five children are forced into marriages here in Ghana, this is normal, quote unquote. Yeah. Especially in this area, the Ghana areas, sure. it's happened so frequently That's that right. They do not really see anything That's wrong right. with 13 year old right. girls give birth, 12 year old girls are having right. sex, and their mothers teach them how to actually care yeah. for themselves during this. So, if this particular girl has been, again, quote, honored like yeah. this, 
she's been put into a, she's been, you know, risen to a level, a certain pedestal. So she's actually been rescued from just having promiscuous, uh, promiscuous life, someone just impregnating her and all that. So maybe the root cause of the problem is poverty. And so we should be focusing on how do we ensure that these women and children are socially, economically empowered, that they do not find the need to give their children away to right. older men for whatever reason. And I thought it made some sense because, well, as a sense now, I understand dogs who have invited the 63-year-old Babu Lomo, but he says customarily he cannot cross some water or something, and so... <laughs> He cannot go. Let, let me not say okay. what's, I do not what's, know what's, the what's on my but mind I think, because uh, I was even surprised by the fact that the traditional groupings were quoting Leviticus at a point. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Crossing carpets to, to explain. To um, but but um, the, listen to the their, lagoon, I think. Listen That's to their, their press conference uh, the or two ago. Um, I know with each day, more facts are coming out. But what I'm hearing per their press conference is that um, there's two, uh, they are married to the deity and not to the Ulomo. I mean, that explanation. The fact that, and that also that, um, so even there are other wives who actually have husbands. Mm. Yes, so. so four, the, four wives. Yeah, the, but, the but so it wives. seems to suggest that there will be no, there are no, actually no conjugal relationships between the two wives and the Ulomo. But I believe uh, as the days go, we, we can't integrate get the issue yeah. more and then get to know. <laughs> the, but it's good, like I said, it's good that the issue has come out. It's important for me. I'm also concerned about the girl's mental health at this stage. And it's important that if, if, she's, if it turns out that yes, she's just going to be a steward, will she be allowed to, that was my main question, will she be allowed to continue to her school, education yeah. to the highest level as she will? Or, and become uh, the best. Yes, she, or she it probably, will not be the case that right. because of her, her new role, she has to come out of school mm -hmm. and, and, and serve in the shrine. For me, that's also an area of... The, the, the only thing I'll add, and I'll do one he two headlines and, and leave, um, the bit that poverty, yes, but I think it's more of a mindset problem. Because, like you said, in some communities, and I don't want to stereotype any grouping, but a lot of people are, are having children, 13, 14, 15, 16. If you're 16 and you don't have a child, it appears you are the odd one out. Yes. And that is highly problematic if you look at it's such human a, rights. It's a stigma. It's just yeah. stigma on you. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, on page five, Usman Sonko appointed Senegalese prime minister. I'm so happy about this because uh, he rooted for the person who yeah, was yeah. more of his deputy. That's right. Basiru is now president, 44. Usman is 49. Senegal has a leadership that is below 50. And I think that should send a signal across Africa. The daybreak, uh, Amisha Dai gets new appointments. So I guess finance minister moved and now he has a new appointment. Amisha Dai, GRA, former GRA boss, is now technical advisor to the finance minister. I love this country. Uh, let's get into your papers. What's there uh, not to okay. love about it? <laughs> so I have here the, uh, from the... President of the Independent Power Generators of Ghana, the decision to halt electricity exports to neighboring countries apt. Um, uh, which, which, which paper are you? This reading? is the Daily Statesman. The Daily Statesman. Yes, right. Uh, I, yeah, I remember last week he, he, he made a case that, uh, he, uh, that GRA, VRA needed to stop exporting power uh, to other countries mm. when we needed the power here. And uh, I don't know if it's as a result of uh, his, his uh, advocacy, but it seems the presidency. The, the sector minister indicated that the president has issued an order to, to, to stop this. Uh, but, but you've uh, heard the reactions as well. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really one thing I was interested in coming here. Right. Because, um, <coughs> uh, so, Atachi, I was saying I was that the, the committee is going to meet, uh, energy committee is going to meet this Saturday to review this. But I mean, it raises questions whether um, it can just happen just like that. Because I'm sure we have, there are contractual issues to, to consider. And of course, uh, there are forex earnings as well. I really have, I'm not very sure of the, uh, the amount of revenue we make from mm. these uh, Togo and Cote d'Ivoire we export to. But I mean, this practice has been going on for, for decades. Yeah. Mm. And uh, uh, yes, and so even if it's going to happen uh, at what point in time, it's going to take place because, like I said, there are key contractor issues that need to be ironed out so that yeah. we don't incur as usual these same judgment debts that uh, we get started with every now and then. But for me, I think uh, the, the government needs to really sit up. Uh, I mean, put out the timetable, as I was saying. I mean, now it's so unpredictable. You, you, you expect to go to the office, and yesterday I, I, I was in town. We had a big program at the Peace Council. I got back to the office around 3, and there was no power. My mom had a power outage almost three days. The light was restored only yesterday. For three yeah. days straight, no yes. power? Yes. So we are, we are being convenienced at home. We are being convenienced in the office. You cannot work. You know, work deadlines are disrupted. So it's important 
let's have a timetable. Look, Ghanaians are very understanding. It's a fact. It's not always that we should have things, MPP and NDC, and politicize issues. Mm. I believe if the government is very candid and tell, we, we all know that there's their financial issue. <coughs> Everybody feels it. So be very candid with Ghanaians and tell us that, look, this is a problem we are having. Let's have the time to we envisage that probably it will take another three months or so to solve it. And then we, let's see you taking specific steps to address the issue. And I think uh, it, will, it will be more comfortable. But, but but I have to ask. And work around that. Why are you wishing evil upon the country? <laughs> <laughs> what if, well, you know, those are the words what of, <laughs> of uh, Dr. The, the, Matthew Opoku Prempe. He says if you I don't start talking there. of it, you are wishing and, and, evil. Okay, then we should, bring our, we should bring our own. But, but two quick things. One being the fact that um, in respect of the contracts, right, th this is a failure. It's a disgrace. You know why? Because even at the height of Doomso in the previous administration, okay, uh, we continued supplying other countries, our contractual agreement. Right. The other side of the coin is you must also bear in mind, if you cut them off, they will have to look for different suppliers, right? So by the time you may be ready to go back, they will be with other people, Somebody which would mean your forex is exactly. gone. So it's not, it's not a very simple exactly. matter. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, uh, maybe any other headline before we go? Um, have you done the daily guide already? Uh, no. We can just do the headlines and then uh, wrap from there. Uh, it's the same Kenya, Ghana, Kenya, DP ties. Um, MPP leads in positive social media comments. Um, the minister takes on a lot of religious claims and an independent candidate pops up in Abuasi West. All right. And then 14 injured in windstorm. Yeah, I think these mm. headlines here. Well, uh, this is how we draw the curtains on this. Later, something else that I'm going to be very excited talking about, scholarships and how the wealthy, those who don't need them are getting them. The, and the, those the, who need them will not get them. The defense is that they are also Ghanaians, and so they, they, they deserve oh, yeah. it. Yeah. But and they are not going to I'll, I'll leave it there. mean they are going to the Harvards and the rest, so exactly. 50,000. I mean, we have, we have, in the past, we've had some of our MPs also cited for... Oh, yeah, in the past. Them, yes, to go for co oh, workshops yeah. and programs yeah. in Harvard and others. Yeah. I mean, you are in government, make the most <laughs> of it, right? That's, yeah. that's what governance means. They say they are, they are also Ghanaians and deserve Well, <laughs> thank, thank you, Remy, for having thank joined you so the much conversation. Yes. Uh, Remy Edmondson is General Secretary of the PPP, and of yes. course, Sweetie. But let Abochi. me just, just on a minor note, um, we use the National Deposition National Secretary for the designation. You use what? National Secretary. National for Secretary. The designation. Not General Secretary. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you, thank uh, you for, having for me. that correction. Right before we head into sports, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic helped us to bring you this segment. They're offering you prostate screening for free if you're a man, fertility screening uh, for free if you're a woman, gratis. Reach out to them at any of their branches here on the crowd. Spintex, opposite the Shell signboard, Kumasi Kronoma Boy here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takwadi Anaji State, Tema Community 22, Techiman Hanswa, and Asiya Manzama. Their call lines 0244 867 068 or 0274 234. Three, two, one. And point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. Oh, and something interesting I, I found in the Daily Graphic newspaper, our quartet, four by hundred, uh, has qualified for the Paris Olympics. You know, it was iffy in there, but they have now. Sports, up next. Stay for that. Welcome back to the AM show. And this right here, right now, is AM exclusive with me. And my guest today, I'm, I'm actually very happy to be chatting with this woman. She's been described as a trailblazer woman in politics. She served in many capacities from legal, political. And um, I like to say she's one of the brilliant female politicians in the country. She was also the former deputy transport minister under the John Mahama administration. And currently, Special aid to the former president, John Dramani Mahama. My guest for AM Exclusive is Joyce Bawa Mokhtari. It is good to have you in the studio. Thank you very much. Very good morning to all of you. Welcome. Yes, you. And I must congratulate you. From all my readings, it appears that you are, um, you've done so much that's admirable, especially as a woman in politics. And 
They describe you as a trailblazer. Oh, really? How would you describe yourself to someone who didn't know you? Just simple Joyce Bauer, hardworking, dedicated, committed, passionate about what I do, and love the Lord. What do you do that you're passionate about? Everything. I'm passionate about my work, mm. passionate about the courses that I love, passionate about my interactions. I'm, whatever I do, I believe in it. If I don't believe in something, I don't do it. Hmm. I'm passionate about empowering the next generation of young girls in particular. I don't mind if it's a generality of young people. I'm also passionate about men who help us in the course of our efforts. And I think that I always single-handedly praise my boss for making it possible for me to actually be comfortable in this role. It's not an easy role. Yeah, it's not. And I remember the days when I used to get these very screaming headlines. I'll be so upset and I'll be so depressed. And you know, he'll be the only one saying to me, oh, don't worry, but this is nothing, you know. I mean, there, there's a lot worse out there. It could be worse. I mean, it's okay. You don't have to worry too much about it. It took me a very long time to navigate this very challenging space. Okay. And How genuinely, long long time? well, it's about 10 years now. Okay. Like joke, like joke. And I'm not someone who's used to talking about myself. It's not something I ever do. I don't think if you ask me even to write about myself, it's possible for me to do so. But I'm sure that for the many people that I engage, for the many students that I have, the many staff that I have, and the colleagues that I interact with, I'm sure that they will probably have very interesting things to say about me. Mm -hmm. But there's also one thing a lot of people don't know. I'm actually very disciplined. Okay. Extremely disciplined. And if you are not very disciplined, you probably won't hang around me for long. Even if you are my friend and you don't exhibit the same qualities of discipline, mm -hmm. I probably would not have you for a friend. Like I say to people all the time, if I sit with you, here with you, I'm here, we're on TV, we're on radio. But if we didn't have to go outside and say anything about our conversation, there's no need for you to go and say it. So even when I have friends, if you don't have that level of discipline, there's no way you can be my friend. And I'll very easily lose you. And this applies in all yes. aspects of In all aspects of my life. I am extremely disciplined, even in my relationships. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I take that very, very seriously. And I think it's a gift that I took from my father. And I think it's an admirable quality that I continue to exhibit. And so... I'm extremely disciplined. When well, your guy called well me this morning, I told him, if I agree to come, I'll be here. Mm -hmm. If I don't want to come, I won't say so. But if I say 7.30, I'll be here before 7.30. And I think it's a quality that all of us should at least have a little bit of. That's admirable. Yeah. Ghanaians aren't very punctual, so yeah, it's good to see no, that. Uh, and I have always been punctual. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you got your education abroad. Would you say that, that's in, that has been the catalyst that propelled you to the successes you've achieved? Your law degree was abroad, your maritime, uh, you got your International Maritime Law Institute for Malta and all that. Would you say that education abroad has helped you get to where you are today? I think education generally is great, mm -hmm. and I think a great education will take you very, very far. Mm -hmm. So I would say that my education generally from primary, secondary school, all through, I think that in many ways, each institution that I have actually been in has somehow had a profound impact on me as an individual. And I think that I don't want to put, I mean, I've also had, <laughs> I've just actually acquired almost a second degree also here in Ghana. Okay. So I think that I take my education What's also that? very, what very seriously. Well, for some weird reason, a colleague of mine encouraged me to <laughs> try a course in communication. I mean, when I started, I almost left it. I mean, did the, you need it? You well, I don't know if I needed it. A I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know if I needed it, but you know, sometimes I am one of those people who enjoys exploring new challenges. Okay. I enjoy new things. For some time I thought that, okay, maybe I've been in the law for so long, I've been in politics for so long. And you know, with politics, we go for these strategic sessions, strategic programs, different courses that are always built to suit you at one time or the yeah. other. But then I thought, okay, maybe for some time now you've been speaking for the party, for the flag bearer, maybe do something different. You know, I see when people brag about how many master's degrees they have, mm. how many PhDs they have. I don't think that I do them because I want to sit and count them every morning. I think what I do them for is just to create more avenues for me, first, to meet new people, secondly, to learn new things, mm. thirdly, to keep my mind very, very busy. I think that there's a way that we stay young, we stay relevant, is that we also keep a very active mind. And your mind can only be active as long as you're doing new things or learning new things. So I think for me personally, everything I learn and the effort I put into it is normally because I believe that your mind should not be left idle. Okay. Let's start the conversation from this scholarship 
uh, Bruhaha ongoing. First of all, was your education scholar, was it funded by some sort of government scholarship or did you pay for it? No, I've had like two scholarships, but none of them was a government scholarship. Okay. I think that the scholarship for the maritime course that I did was actually a United Nations funded program. It was a very, very expensive program. It also has a certain bias towards females in particular okay. who were interested in the maritime. So I think I was very, very lucky in that sense. It was a very highly competitive scholarship. I went in for the interview. I took the aptitude test. I came top of that particular list. So I think that it took quite a lot of effort and preparation. But yes, coming from Ghana with the background that I already had and the qualities that I already exhibited wherever I was at the time, I think that it made a huge impact and made it possible for me. Okay. You know, I remember years ago when we first left government, I'm sure if you check, you remember that story. We were part of a group that were actually accused even mm. of taking government scholarships. Okay. I mean, honestly, short of driving past the scholarship secretary because I used to do some stuff at the Ghana Maritime Authority, mm. I have never okay. walked into the Ghana Scholarship Secretariat for myself, a family member, a friend, or anybody for that matter. I know it exists. I've met students at different parts of my life who've had scholarships from that particular entity. I think that this, the, the whole reason why that institution was set up was for very, very good reasons. Mm. For brilliant, needy students in particular. Mm. I remember when Mr. Mahama and Professor Mills were in office, Ghana had just become a nascent oil producing country, for example. Mm. So many young people who exhibited aptitudes in uh, the sciences and petroleum and in energy were actually sent to all sorts of countries, especially to Scotland, yeah. to go and pursue courses in improving or coming to work in our petroleum sector. So there are some very good things that that secretariat does. Yeah. But yes, there's also the infamy of whether or not persons who receive these scholarships actually need them. For my kind of scholarship, I'm sure if I had worked there, they would have told me that it was too expensive to be funded by the government of Ghana because okay. I've heard that too from many people who try to access similar scholarships. Mm. Look, we all need to criticize some of these things to make them better. I mean, I don't know what the criteria is. I'm not sure what the requirements are. But I would want to believe that if you are capable of sponsoring your awards, and that you do not need to access government scholarships, then you should do that. The honorable thing is that leave it for those who genuinely need it yeah. or encourage them to give it to people who actually need it. Look, there are some amazing things that scholarships do. I look at myself at the time when I wanted to go back to school. There is no way that I could have put together that kind of money. Mm. My tuition fees alone were in excess of 60,000 euros. I also wow. had a, yes. That's a lot of money. A lot, great, a great deal of money any day. And this was about 10 years ago. Yeah. Even today, still a lot of money. In dollars, in euros, name it. So these are very huge commitments. And this was done by gov you know, a United Nations body. Contributions from member states. Mm -hmm. Monies that they believe should be expended on individuals who will go back to their countries and make that difference. The purposes behind these scholarships are sometimes even more laudable than what we gain from them. And when I got that scholarship, I made the very best out of it. I came top of my class. I got the best award for my dissertation. I took it very, very seriously. So the persons who invested in me didn't waste the money. And even till today, I continue to live up to the expectations of that scholarship. And you came back to the country Always. you were serving Always. in. A few weeks ago, Walker I told Parson. somebody, yeah. I could have lived anywhere. But somehow, I've never wanted to. Maybe I'm my father's daughter. <laughs> I love Ghana. And I love what Ghana holds for my future. Sarah, I think that when you go to a billing pay and some other visa application centers, you see young people getting out of this country in drones and going through all manner of things just to secure funding to get out of this country. Some have cited the harsh economic uh, weather in this country, unemployment, underemployment and all that. What's your assessment of this situation? The way young people are eager to leave this country, whether for education, for um, familiar or whatever, but they do not want to return because they think there's no hope for this country. I mean, look, my sister, 
if people don't get into jobs such as yours mm. or have opportunities such as mine, what would they do? You meet a young person at age 35, probably almost 40, mm. and they've never been able to secure a decent, well-paying job. When Mr. Mahama provided this opportunity for us to debate the proposal of the 24-hour economy, mm. I remember people found it, you know, we even tried very hard to undermine it. Suddenly I hear that, oh, okay, in the morning they tell us that the password office will be working 24-7, mm. or they tell us that, oh, you know, this, oh, you know, think about it. If we have a three-shift system, for example, a lot of the young people who leave university, and this year I'm told that 1.4 million young people have left our institutions of learning. If we don't create more avenues for sustainable employment, are we going to be able to continue to take taxpayers' money, give it to partisan young people who are associated or affiliated to us only, mm. and create NAPCO, create men in security, women in prison work, in sanitation, and all of these things? How long do they keep these jobs for? How many people will put these re references even on their CVs or resumes and be able to get a job because they worked at NAPCO, for example? You know, look, we keep majoring in minus. Mm. We need to do something more than what has always been done. If we're going to be building an export-driven economy, then so be it. It means let's get all industries to feed into this perspective. Mm. Let's agree that everybody who is able to run a 24-hour shift system should be given a certain incentive. Why? People come into this country to invest in affordable housing. We give them a five-year tax holiday. Why can't we do the same for someone who wants to build an industrial enclave, for example, in Tema? Mm. Someone who wants to take advantage of the free zones, license, for example, and go all the way to the Upper East region. Look at the time it takes to arrive there, the travel time and all of that. Why don't we make it count by saying that, look, if you take your industries to this region, to that region, to this other part of the country, these are the incentives you get. Look. It's because the cost of living is even lower in those places. Yeah. I know medical doctors who took postings to some of these further places. They have remained there. They've become farmers. They've set up schools. They've set up hotel facilities, guest houses. They saw opportunities that even those of us who come from those places didn't see before. Yeah. You, you understand? What we need to do is to encourage government, for example, to create an enabling environment, offer support. And you see, sometimes we overemphasize the talk more than the actual action. Mm. Look, I told Mr. Mahama recently that if he were to introduce the 24-hour economy, I would go also to the radio stations and demand that it should be implemented in the manner in which we are advocating for. Because you see, most of the young people who are totally unengaged, and they tell you, underemployment is even worse. Yeah. So all these top gap measures that we keep offering to people, what does it mean? Seriously, how much would be your pension if you stayed on NAPCO for the next five years? What would be the opportunity for you to build a small house for yourself and your family? What kind of education can you provide for your young children? You know, I weep for the fact that we no longer see the blushing brides or the mourning widows, for example. I weep for the innocence of the young people who struggle to leave the country. I cry for our siblings who cannot find just a basic sustainable job. You know, I listen to older people tell you that when they left the walls of the universities, they had people waiting on the staircase to recruit them. We don't have that anymore. No, we don't. Because one, there are so many of us. The queues are very long. The jobs are not there. But what is it that is making it impossible for the jobs to be there? The economy is very tight. Look at the rate of inflation. Look at the cost of borrowing to invest in your business. Mm. Look at the cost of going as a worker even to take a loan facility to support your business. Okay. Look at all those who have the second incomes. Ask them, how are they coping? We will touch on all these things in the course of the conversation. But I must say that I see what you mean by being a passionate person. Do oh, you have yeah. political ambition? Do you see yourself becoming a president someday? I've never even thought about my life beyond <laughs> the day when I wake up. I just thank God okay. that I woke up today and I ask myself, what are you going to do? to make a positive impact this morning. I think beyond that, everything yeah. else is given. That's good to know. Now, because you are such an experienced legal practitioner and member of the African Women Lawyers Association, I'd like to take your view or your assessment on this ongoing child's rights issue. I know you've heard or you're following the story of the 63-year-old Wulomo, and um, who's, they say it's a betrothal, 
of this 12th year. Now they say it's, he's 16 years old. Um, the laws clearly say that it's, it's a crime. No child should be forced into marriage. No child below the age of 18 should be forced into marriage or even be betrothed to anybody, especially that's with that age gap. What do you think of the situation? Look, you know, there are so many cultural practices mm. that actually militate against the young girl child. Mm. It's not just in Greater Accra, it's in the Upper West region, yeah. it's in the Northern region, the Savannah region. In fact, according you to Minister, they say one in five girls. There's so many of them, yeah. you know. I mean, I remember conversations around female genital mutilation, and recently I've read a very interesting story from Ethiopia where an, a women's group is actually advocating for a return to FGM which was banned some years ago. A women's group? A women's group. And it's actually threatening even to go to court to have that act overturned. So you, 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 you get what I mean. Cultural things can be very, very, you know, emotional. They actually evoke enormous emotions in a lot of people. And in the days since this matter has actually become part of our news and conversations, mm. I have heard very enlightened people even hiding to criticize because they don't want to do so publicly. You, you understand? And I've tried to understand that cultural you know, conversation too mm -hmm. in the context of the Gaza state. Mm -hmm. Be that as it may, there will always be different schools of thought about the matter. Should a 12-year-old even be betrothed to some adult for whatever reason? But yes, we have trocosi, we have all the elopements of young girls for marriage, and many other things that really don't help the progress of the girl child or the women generally. So I'm happy that this conversation has come up. And of course, I've heard how from age 12 is now by age 16. You know what I mean. Not a marriage. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So nomenclature may be you know, trying to make something that looks very bad appear much better than it is, or trying to generate some acceptability within the public domain, etc. Look, we need to allow young girls to grow and develop. Is the same for the teenage pregnancies that okay mm. for the grown-up men. There's a lot of pedophilia as well in the system. You know, there are so many ills, so many ills in our society. And I like the fact that this conversation has actually led us to all these other debates about all these other things. There's a social protection bill that we worked on many, many years ago. We haven't had it yet being passed into law. You know, so we need to take these things very, very serious. And look, social media is fantastic. But for social media, stories such as this will probably remain what they are. And it's, it's just yes. one of such Absolutely. cases yes, that has yes, come yes, to light. Yes. But there's so many of them. And across Ghana, generally, there is many practices that we all need to condemn. There's one about scarifications of the marks and tribal marks that we give to young children. For example, it happens to people get infected, they lose their lives. FGM is another thing that you know, people actually use all the time, widowhood rights. Another example, look, we have legislations to tackle all these things. Yeah. And usually when they actually come up for mention and for discussion, the state agencies ought to take responsibility and take charge. And in this yeah. case, apparently, I heard the Deputy Attorney General has uh, actually taken a great yeah. interest in this matter. Yes. And apparently the young girl has been taken into police yes. custody of salts. Yes. Let's see how it and goes, Dove you know. Absolutely, and yes. And I think but, that mm -hmm. Dove Sue does a very, very good job. And they've always done a fantastic job. So okay. let's see how it goes. I mean, I don't think that this is a conversation that should be made partisan or anything. I think it is just that there's so many of these cultural things. There's a lot of misogyny in our society. Look, it doesn't matter how high you go. You still experience it one way or the other. And so I think that there's some men who make it possible for us to stand very tall and make life much easier for us than it is. But there are also those ones who do things that actually militate against our progress. But all of us together should continue to advocate that some of these things ought to be do I and mean, cast them into the bins where they belong. I mean, we have more important things than what makes any of yeah. the chief or somebody So we happy. put a question, I think two days ago, to the um, Nana Oye Bampo yeah. about if it turns out through investigations that this girl has been defiled or there are some evidence of conjugal activities, should the 63-year-old Wulomo be arrested? And I understand that because we are walking such a fine line between customary practices and rule of law, uh, it's a, also a sensitive matter. There are some nuances that need to be really navigated well. 
from your experience as a legal practitioner over the years, do you think that or should we arrest this man if the evidence points that the girl was in fact defiled or what, was betrothed? Why, why to the do man? you want to preempt <laughs> what the police will tell us eventually? There's an ongoing investigation. I believe I listened to my sister Nanoye speak yes. to this matter. She's an expert in the field and has done many, many things, worked the, you know, the straight and narrow on these matters. Yes. She the, the law on these matters is in her bosom. Okay. And so if they're investigating, let's allow the law to take its course. Okay. And personally, I listened to all the traditional persons who have spoken about the matter. So far, I haven't heard that there's been any tampering of any sorts. I haven't heard of any matters to do with sex or sexual assault for that matter or any of these things. I mean, these are matters that in our society are usually discussed in the closet or in the bedroom. But obviously, if there's been anything like that, I'm sure that eventually we'll be made you know, conscious or aware of it and definitely action will be taken. You know, look, these are very delicate matters and sometimes irrespective of your professional uh, outlook, you need to navigate very cautiously. I remember years ago, there was a matter in the Upper West region, and I remember commenting on it, and there was a very, very senior Muslim lawyer who called me and was very upset and didn't see why, did I, you know, why I did that. Recently, there was another lady who actually went to the beach dressed a certain way, and there was some, you know, generated some annoying, or, you know, opprobrium. I mean, why would she wear? But I was wondering, what do you expect her to wear? I mean, she's a great artist, she's a performer, and encourages people to, you know, tourists to the region. She's done amazing things in the region. Mm. Was recently at the a, a stadium here in Accra to perform at the closing ceremony of the, uh, you know, the or sports. You know, think about it. People should be allowed to be who they are, especially if they're of age, and do the things that they do because they are responsible adults. But even that one received enormous criticism. So sometimes there's a certain conflict right. between what societal norms and nuances are as against what cultural uh, nuances also allow you to do. So I think that in all of these things, the conflicts will exist. Don't forget, there's even conflicts between the state in terms of governance and, of course, the, the rulers, the traditional rulers, and these things happen. Who stands up for the president? Who sits for the president? When the president walks in, should all the kings stand up? Should all the chiefs sit and stand recently? There was a spot about the national anthem and where some chiefs actually sat through it yes. and the president was very offended. You know, there, these conflicts are there and right. all of us live through them. So okay. let's look at how the jurisprudence goes and see what comes out of the investigation. Okay. But yes, I'm happy that some effort has been put into it and that the Deputy Attorney General has herself shown a keen interest and will take the matter up. And of course, Oye and others, they are experts in the area. We all will wait to see what the outcome is. Let's talk about the Mahama campaign. Okay. You speak for former President John Domani Mahama. Can you give me a highlight of what Mahama wants to do differently given the, time, given the opportunity in December or when, if he wins and sworn in in January 2025? Exactly what is Mahama going to do differently? You see, I think that uh, the campaign has so far gone very, very well. As an individual who had a mass, works for, and believes in the vision of Mahama for all of us, I think that he's going to run a very honest campaign a clean campaign, a campaign born out of sincerity and experience, a campaign also born out of a man who started a certain uh, course, started a certain conversation, and probably didn't end the conversation, and wants to come back and finish what it is that he started. Mm -hmm. You know, look, we must start to look at our leaders more for who they are, what they offer us. You know, imagine you had a leader whose doors were shut all the time and you knock, then the doors will not even open for you. It would be difficult for you to interact with that leader. Imagine you're the leader who looked at you and all the time told you things that he knows very well that you don't believe, but would share them anyway, thinking that, you know, you probably don't have the right to question me or you will not even be able to question me. Mm. Imagine that you're the leader who simply wanted to lord it on all of us, to insist on wielding power in a way that we didn't expect. You know, sometimes... We belabor leadership. We can also have a certain very simple, sincere, hardworking, responsive, proactive kind of leadership. Look, I have watched over the last 10 years since I've actually been politically active. I am almost convinced that Mr. Mahama is one of the most credible politicians we have in Ghana. That what he says is what he believes in. Remember that the exigency of the day 
may probably not make it possible for a leader to do all the things that they imagine doing for us as a people. Mm. But what would you rather have? A leader who at least makes an effort, who has started on a certain journey, who has told you that I'm inviting all of you to become stakeholders in the next conversation that I want to have with the good people of Ghana. Mm -hmm. Join me to do it. Other than that, look at what we have. In the days of Mr. Mahama, fuel was definitely cheaper. We had a tomato factory in Adan. We had a Comenda sugar factory. We had the Gihok shoe factory that was re, uh, you know, rejuvenated and started working again. We had the shea butter processing factory in Bipe, for example. We had made the Avnash rice processing mill that was built in the northern region. And now in the northern region, unlike when it was just the composite of all the regions. You know, think about it. We had the mechanized centers that were being built and started in the upper east region, for example, because we needed more water, more farm inputs, better access to all the things that farmers require. You know, there is a certain conversation that we sometimes refuse to have. Okay. The credibility of the messages that our leaders share with us. I watch how people started to talk about uh, the e-blocks, for example. Go to the areas where these blocks are being used fully and see what contributions they've made to the communities. But we all fell for the propaganda that these buildings were what? In bushes. Today, when you drive around the country, for all the ones that are being used, do you see any bushes around them? In the days when we were young, most secondary schools were distances away from the communities. Go back to those same schools today. The communities have grown to meet the schools. These days, when I go to Tamale Secondary School, I struggle to find the demarcations for the school. When I go to St. Francis Girls Secondary School, I struggle to find the demarcations to the school. When I go to Wesley Girls High School mm. in Cape Coast, I struggle to find the demarcations. As a young child going to all of these schools, it was so easy to see them the minute you arrived in the community. So we, we, we sometimes don't interrogate some of the propaganda. But remember that 2024 is not 2016 that we've had a comparative opportunity to look at what the MPP has and what it has offered mm. and to see what the NDC has and what it has offered. What is not in doubt is that for every public university that you see in this country, check the history since the days of Nkrumah, you'll find the contributions of the NDC from the PNDC right up to this date. And I think that as social democrats, most often than not, the NDC believes more in what? Social equity equality, fairness, and justice. So for example, what will be concentrated in Greater Accra, we would rather think that, no, let's give a little bit to everybody. So now we have 16 regions. The Mahama says that each region should be recognized for what it is that they produce, okay. what they can produce, what they need, what they desire. How to revamp a local economy is how we can all get little bits and pieces feeding into the national kitty. All right. No, there's, there's no magic about this. Okay. What he's telling us is that this time I want to go on this journey with all of you. Join me, join us. Let's deliver on the Ghana that all of us want to see. I think that's about it. I mean, look at on the Corruption Perception Index, for example. Okay. You know what the score is for the MPP? It's zero. The Special Prosecutor's Office is in itself now. Very frustrated. Inundated with corruption, but cannot investigate. Can do absolutely nothing because... Their hands have been tied behind them. What did we see? Yesterday I listened to Manasse, who used to work here. He spoke about the JIDA report, about the report on the Ford navigation. As soon as the work was concluded, the reports were made public, and all of you were all over the place, biting into them at left and right and center. What has happened today? The KPMG audit on SML is out. The yeah. president says, I received it. And I know Nothing. that he's had it for a very, very long time. Oh, how long? Oh, oh I'm sure at least he's had it for close to a month if I'm not mistaken, and yet need, still needs time to do what? Why has that report not been leaked like all the other reports that they used to leak? No, look, why has uh, Dr. Frimpon Boate not be commended for coming out to defend a report that government itself commissioned? You see, these are the things that we do not want to see our leaders do, to, you know, literally hide behind the shield of government and mislead and misrepresent and create the wrong impression. All these things feed into the corruption perception index. They feed into the lack of media freedoms that we are currently experiencing. They also don't encourage 
effective peer review mechanisms. And you, I always say, one of the biggest things going for Mr. Mahama is that he's largely a very affable, credible individual. What you see is what you get. I think that more than anybody, I mean, recently I've heard it, the biggest joke of the century, that the MPP is actually forum shopping or, you know, literally going out there to shop for a female running mate. Yeah. When Mr. Mahama nominated Professor Nana Jane in 2020, what was the reaction? There was some backlash. Absolutely. Did Look. you have any influence on that decision? You know, I, ben, saw, I saw that you were very vocal about the call for a female running mate. Well, personally, no. You know, I always say that to sit with Mr. Mahama, to have conversations with him, will tell you why he has survived in politics all this while. While he has been capable of reinventing himself and becoming that refreshing voice that all of us relate to. It is because Mr. Mahama is also a very deep thinker. You know, he's not naturally a very sociable kind of person. You will not ordinarily find Mr. Mahama sitting at the table and leading the debates and having very long, lengthy arguments. Mm. But put him to strict proof. Ask him a question about any subject matter. You'll be surprised the level of knowledge that he will bring to bear to the, on the conversation. Unfortunately, we don't you have know. enough time. And I want to touch on a few things before we go. You know that um, this John Mahama's government have criticized this, the Kufuado government, for going to the IMF. I mean after saying time and again that they will not go and borrow, they will not go to the IMF. But John Mahama also went to the IMF. And sometimes, well, comparatively, he's been in office less than this current government, about five years less. But he was vice president um, during Atam Nelson's time before he assumed office. Comparatively, would you say that Mahama's government or Mahama's administration, coupled with Atam combined, have done better than this government? What would be your assessment? Oh, certainly yes. I mean, even on the key indicators such as on corruption, mm. inflation, on media freedoms, on inflation, on all, even on the foreign exchange mm. rates, for example. Today, the dollar is nearly 14 CDs to a dollar. How, I mean, that's totally unimaginable, unbelievable. Where did we go wrong? So it means that the export drives didn't succeed? The effort to reduce inflation, where is it? We are currently borrowed to the hill, 610 billion Ghana cities and counting from 210 billion in the last how many years? You know, look, I don't want us to compare peaches and apples. Look at the cost of food inflation even. Our hungry are going hungrier. Mm. Our poor even poorer. Mm. So on all the social indexes, for example, this government is performing a lot worse than the former administration. And for all the criticism that they actually you know, held at the former administration. Tell me, on all the things they criticized the most, on which of those indices have they performed better, even on the subject of IMF? But remember, I have always maintained that Ghana is a state party to the IMF agreement. They contribute to the success story of the IMF. So if there's a need for us to go for policy uh, credibility and need stabilization and require some funds, for example, why not? But you see, because we do not literally raise the bar on the debates. We don't raise the conversation higher than what it is. Mm. We reduce it to all this very nitty gritties of just partisanship. Nobody looks at things very carefully. But when you do, why do you want to blame the previous administration for going to the IMF if it's going to come and reduce poverty, if it's going to come and save us from imminent collapse, if it's going to come and actually literally augment what government is already doing? Today, for example, most of the homegrown solutions that said Tekpe and others were talking about, they are the conversations we are having now. Why? But we spent so much time, and the media encouraged them to go on the high tangent of literally decrying everything the former administration did as wrong and unacceptable and unethical, and literally allowed them to run roughshod over everybody. We even celebrated exiting the IMF at the time. We came here and watched and all of those yeah. things. How have we fared? Today, look at where the pension bondholders are. For example, we are unable to pay back their investments. Older people, people who work very hard for their money, who didn't enjoy the political patronage that we all experience from other quarters. They are the ones now struggling to get their monies back. Go and check on people like my mother at 84, for example. What is the pension that she receives? Where is the investment that she made and hoped that she would probably use it even to help her grandkids pay for their school fees? These are the conversations that matter. 
yeah. to the many Ghanaians who are around, who will never see the seats of power. And what is it Mr. Mahama is saying? He himself, you can see Mr. Mahama. I mean, he has no love or want for all the grandiose things that people like. Mr. Mahama went for a party in the Ashanti region. And there was then a very hot topical song at the time. And they danced to the song with everybody, including the venerable king at the time, and the president, and many other very important guests. Look at the fury that greeted it from our opponents then. They've come back from Kweu. The president celebrated his 80th birthday. Mm. Why are we not making noise about the fact that the president, despite all the challenges, the hunger, the corruption that we are all experiencing, has time to celebrate or commemorate his well, 80th birthday? Well, it's his birthday. I mean. Ex can you dis exactly the point I'm making? You understand? Yeah. 80 is a great age. To live up to 80 is not yeah. an easy thing. Mm -hmm. And to be 80 when you are president, likewise. But why did he not give the same opportunity to his predecessor? He was human too. He was a person too. He had feelings too. Okay. He also had birthdays to celebrate. And that song wasn't commissioned by him, was it? You know, look, if we raise the bar on our political discourse, I mean, like I talk all the time, you can go and interrogate everything I've said here and then tell me whether... It is true or false, you understand. In the whole hour we've engaged, I haven't engaged in any yeah, propaganda. Partisan. No. Yeah, but the things I say are things that every Ghanaian can relate to. All right. On the conversations that Ghanaians need to Absolutely. be Absolutely. This anti-LGBTQ matter, where do you stand on this? Do, well, we, I, need, do we really need an anti-LGBTQ plus bill or law? You see, I don't want to wade into this debate. I think that there's enormous conversation around it already. Mm. I believe that I said Mr. Mahama, he has made his position very clear from the standpoint of the very Christian and traditional environments that we have here. I think the rest of it is a matter that we leave to the persons who are most interested in how this bill actually goes. And I think right now there's a huge spat between Parliament and the Speaker and, of course, the President of the country. So if it I think that, that we way. should just leave it and let them discuss it. When the Gitmo II arrived in Ghana, mm. Mr. Hado then, as Kande, was consulted. What support did he give to Mr. Mahama when he received all the attacks from just about anybody? Okay. He didn't offer any attempts or advice or support. No, this is his own headache. Let him carry it. I think that sometimes we should leave issues exactly where they are supposed to be. He's President. He can decide whether to accent to the bill or not. That is his prerogative. I believe that he's communicated the same to Parliament. Parliament has decided to take some actions. Let's see what happens. This is what we actually go out there to support that 275 member Parliament to do for us. Mm -hmm. We have a speaker who is no mean a person, very knowledgeable, experienced lawyer, someone whose feet we are still learning at. Same with the president. Let's see how the conversation goes. I think that sometimes we allow too much politics in some of these conversations. It's a matter that just like what you discussed earlier about cultures and how they clash yeah. sometimes with our, our, our laws yeah. and our jurisprudence. We have the same things between the judiciary and parliament in terms yeah. of the fourth estate, which is the realm, in terms of the media and government. You know, these conflicts come, but what it should do is to help strengthen our democracy. And I think this is one of those exercises. Okay, but what I'm curious about is, this seems to be going on for a while, and there's a possibility that they won't, they won't conclude on the matter before the elections. If that happens, and if Mahama comes to power, how would he tackle this? I haven't sought his views on the matter. <laughs> if you okay. ask that same question but ten you speak, times... you speak for him. You speak for Mahama. Oh, but on a matter of what he will do in the yeah. event that the bill is left unsigned, mm. I will have to ask him personally. Okay. But that will be his own responsibility anyway as president at any given time. And I am hopeful that Ghanaians know what is right for them. That Mr. Mahama, considering the effort he has put in, the credibility that he has, the trustworthiness of Zamahama, will actually determine the fact that he should be our next leader. And so when that happens, I'm sure that if there's anything that is left unsaid and there's a need for him to take that and make it his whatever, I'm sure there are things that he will do. Because like I said, I mean, when you are in a position, generally the power is not yours. It does not lie in your mouth. And uh, so when it comes to our democracy, yes, people will ask you where you stand on one matter or the other. Okay. And beyond flip-flopping like some people are doing, I think that he has made his uh, sentiments very well known. And the rest, as I say, will allow history to judge. My final topic, uh, question on this Mahama campaign, before we talk about what's, how you navigate being a woman in politics, would be on the issue of the choice of a running mate. Mahama, if 
the NDC wins power, Mahama can only go for one term, which would mean that if you win again, Professor Jinnan of Okwajiman might be the one leading the affairs of the NDC. Do you think Ghana is ready for a female vice president? A female president? You know, I don't want to belabor the point. Why is Ghana not ready for a female president? Well, I'm, I, I want to know why or why you think we are ready for it. I don't see why not. Okay. Look in the media, many general managers are women. Well, it's because Look in there's banking. a lot of backlash on the choice of, even from parliament. There's 52% the there. of us. Mm. If we decided Monday morning to make Nana Jane the vice president of Ghana, who can stop us? Okay. Anything, I mean, it's a given. Yeah. You, you understand that? You know, look, is it because women are not well qualified? No, we are more exactly. than qualified. Is it because <laughs> they cannot lead the country and probably do a good job? Certainly. And look, like I said, it takes a man with a very futuristic outlook mm. to be so certain in his mind that I'll go out there, despite all that I know will come, and pick this particular individual. And that I will even go ahead to re-nominate this particular individual. And you know, I am naturally very passionate about everything female. I saw a write-up somewhere when someone said that, oh, Joyce is vociferous support. What is vociferous about it? I work for Mr. Mahama at this time. Mm. If Mr. Mahama wakes up in the morning and says, sweetie, you are the one I'm going with, it is my responsibility to support him in that endeavor. So shouldn't we be encouraging the NPP? You've called them copycats for now struggling to find a female running mate because NDC led that, uh, that, that charge. I mean, if it's such a good thing for us to have a female let, let me tell you, Let me president. tell you something about the NPP if you want to have this conversation. I doubt that they hold on strongly to anything. I think that they are naturally very inconsistent on everything that they raised and made an issue of. They've done a lot worse. You know, I don't like to spend time dwelling on the yeah. feelings or lack of it of, for the MPP. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that for both Akufado and uh, his vice president, I don't think that they even know what it is that they really want to achieve. All they want is to be in power and continue to take us all for a ride. So their issues are very different. So let's leave them where they are. I think that any leader in Ghana today understands the exigency of the day. That what Ghana needs is not tokenism. So you see, look at her credentials as a female, for example. Look at her qualifications. Yeah. Professor Mills was a high achiever. One who went into university at the age of 16. He was president of Ghana. Yeah. You understand? Mm -hmm. So I think that beyond overburdening the subject of being a woman or a female, we have an accomplished pair of hands going to join a very experienced individual. Why not? Even the Bible says that this is the right way of doing things. Why don't we give it a chance? In any case, as I say all the time, we've tried it all. <laughs> Why don't we try something different? Yeah. 52% is against the other side. And then let's see what happens. We are the majority after all. But sometimes as women in certain positions of leadership, you encounter what I like to call a boys club, you know, where it's difficult for women to penetrate and reign over there. I'm sure you've encountered a few of such issues. How did you navigate? If you like, you can share an experience and how you navigated to come up at top. Well, it happens all the time. Mm. I remember years ago, my former boss looked at me and said, ah, JP, you know, sometimes I even forget you're a woman. <laughs> you ah. know, the way you walk into this room and then you demand what you want and you yeah. act as if the whole space is for you. Look at the way you even walked into my office. <laughs> So yes, okay. you see that is why you also need something beyond just being you. Mm. Have great qualifications, have good qualities as a human being, have a great work ethic, raise the bar wherever you find yourself. You see with me, I am so humble that if you ask me to be a tea lady for a week, you'll come back and have tea every day. And today, let me remember Auntie Sheriati. Mm. When she came to the pres former president's office once, I served the tea in a very lovely cup. And I made sure that the tea was not even at the rim. It was just before the uh, full cup. Okay. She said, wow, that's amazing. I'd come back here for tea every day. That is me. I do everything diligently. diligently. It's like waking up to exercise. I mean, today I knew I was coming here. I said to my gym instructor, we have to finish early. And then he said, if you get here early. By 5 a.m. I was there. 45 minutes we were done. And I got here even before 7.30. That is me. Once I commit to something, I'll do it and do it to the best. Look, I haven't undertaken this course 
of working with Mr. Mahama lightly. It has come with enormous criticism. Mm. There have been days when I wanted to just walk away. It's normal. But it is in the strength you have as an individual. You always go back into it. And like I say, the best thing that ever happened to me is to have a boss who also has a certain sensitivity level. So recently we were on a campaign tour. There's been another lady who's joined us. And then he said, oh, you know, we always forget that we have ladies on the team now. We never stop to make proper bathroom breaks. Mm. Maybe in future when you guys need it, let's know. So we stop the vehicles at a hotel or somewhere so it's convenient for you. I've been working with him for 10 years. When you get a bad streaming headline, you'll be the first to offer you support. So the, sometimes we also need that. You know, I have been very fortunate. Maybe because of my level of dedication. If you speak to my former boss today, he'll tell you that he still misses working with me. If you meet the former Chief Justice, Madame Chidra Wood, I used to run the training for judges in the Maritime Seminars. She will tell you the same thing about me. Mm. I take my work ethic and I take it very, very seriously. I think that beyond the beautiful qualifications that we all can acquire, yeah. if you add a decent, good work ethic, people can tell. But yes, you still suffer the same things. Men try to pull you down. They don't even give you enough credit for the effort that you make. Mm. They don't celebrate you enough. Even the people who benefit from your outlook the most. Sometimes we'll forget even to acknowledge the contributions that you make. But ask yourself, have I done it well? Have I given it my best? Have I been as dedicated as I should be? Once you can answer yes to all those questions, the rest is done. But at the end of the day, God is your helper. I don't think this comes naturally to most women. Or has that been your second nature throughout? Confidence in doing or is it just because you do your work diligently, you've not really encountered any time when you feel like you cannot be as vocal because you're a woman? I, love, I speak to a lot of young women, and they tell me that sometimes when they come face to face with certain situations where men are dominated, they can't find their voice. But imagine that they tried to look within them mm. and actually found their voices for once. Imagine the difference that would make. You said, no, that's the challenge. When you feel something, that's not about women, like I say all the time. Yeah. How often do you see women boasting, bragging, yeah. talking to you, ask a woman, oh, can I offer you this? And they will tell you all the things they have. Oh, can I support you with this? And they tell you how strong they are. You know, think about it. But men are very comfortable yeah, exactly. talking about themselves. That you is the difference. Men are uh, their stories. Uh, that is you know? it. <laughs> they walk and talk their stories. Yeah. So you see most successful women that you see that you admire. Mm. Look at them carefully. They've imbibed a certain aspect of that. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah. Every time you meet a woman who is successful, look at it very carefully. You know, like I told somebody once when, you know, you know how you know, people like to spread negative and necessary stories about people. You know, I tell you all the time that people who judge and criticize the most are not perfect themselves. They just enjoy doing that. I mean, we all have days when we want to criticize one thing or the other. But, you know, a criticism that is not valuable, that it will not add value to somebody's life that will not make any difference to somebody. Why do you bother? Yeah. The worst type of it is the very low ones that people do, you know, trying to denigrate people's images character. in the eyes and yeah. character in the eyes of others. Yeah. You know, think about it. If you speak volumes, if you speak positively, if you are that example that people want to see, who cares what your negatives are? There are no perfect human beings. Yeah. People don't get where they are because they are perfect. They're certainly not. I mean, think about it. Yeah. Be the first to cast the stone. Yeah. There are no perfect people. What we need are people who believe in something, who stand for something, who encourage others, who help others, who support others. I think that this is the sort of leaders, or these are the sorts of leaders that all of us want to see. And people, look, leadership is not about only those who are in politics, for example. When you come to work in the morning, there is someone who makes the tea, who makes sure that there's tea, there's coffee. There's someone who cleans the desk and does it beautifully. There's someone who arranges the seats and makes sure that they're good. Someone does your hair. Someone takes care of your clothes. Think about it. If they did not have a passion about the things that they did, what would the results be for you? I think that wherever you find yourself, and that is my mantra, however small the corner, take that corner, make it different. You know, someone told me something a few weeks ago that you are one of the few spokespersons that I haven't had a newspaper taken to court. Is it because you're a lawyer? I had never actually thought about it. But I know just what to say, when to say it,
how to yeah. say it. That's and I know it just when to stop. Mm. You understand? So maybe yes. That is what the legal training does for me. But you won't find me in the morning boasting about what a great lawyer I am, what a great advocate I am, what a great author or writer I am. But you are a great lawyer. Well, people say <laughs> My that. My final question to you would be, that I is it difficult? How, how do you find it combining family and all the work you do in politics? Because every day, someone has something to say about you. How do you prevent that from seeping into your family life? or your personal life? You know, I think that what we all have to learn to do is to achieve a very good balance. Oh, sorry, let me chip this in. Your family is also in the political landscape. Your husband was former CEO, yes. and your sister is Otiko Jaba. So combining all that, how do you prevent, how do you draw that balance from family and then your life? <laughs> It's easy. The media space. Yeah. You know, I remember the Miliband brothers in the UK. They were on different sides of the aisle. Yeah. One became prime minister. One was member of parliament. Even in Ghana, we have the Jinapo brothers who yes. are doing the same. Mm. In Abidjan and Ivory Coast, I'm told there's a couple, husband and wife, who are both in parliament, for example. Okay. You know, I think that it depends on what we all want to do, what we aspire to, what inspires us, what it is that really makes us happy. But you see, navigate all of it by achieving a very good balance. I think I'm a great how, how mother. How do you do that? By committing. Look, my former boss who was female years ago, when I just started out and had my son, told me that it is not how much time you spend with your kids. Mm. It's the quality of the time you spend with your kids. Right. So I make sure that the time I spend with my kids is so valuable that they never forget. And so people meet me and they ask me, how did you raise a son like that? How did you raise kids like that? It's because I have made sure that I navigate, you know, I used to tell my staff that I actually recruit you bright young people because I expect you to help my kids with their homework. <laughs> okay. Yes, and I will tell them very, very, so I know who is good in mathematics, I know who is good in science, I know who is good in English. Does that come with some extra money for them? Or oh, sometimes a little tip here and there, and of course, if yeah. I go away and buy you something. Yeah. And you know, I see them today and I tell them, my kids are the way they are because of you guys. Mm. You know, my PA who was very close to me for many years is now a lawyer, she's just become a mother. So I have all of these people that make it possible for me to achieve that balance. But you see, like I said, we're not men. We don't boast about who we are yeah. and what we do. It's not something that we do. I would say that for most women, it is because we say experience me first. Mm. You understand? Yeah. If you want to give me a job, give me that job and see how well I'll do it. If you want to see how good I am, offer me an opportunity and see how well I'll do it. But certainly, we don't get enough credit. That is a fact. But it's amazing that a few people actually will observe yeah. and see that you actually make an effort. And that should suffice. And God will always help us achieve something beyond even our expectations. And I am also very, very humble in the sense that I believe that my parents contributed enormously to the person that I am today. My late father in particular, and my mother, who is still a great influence on me, even at 84. So I think that sometimes you also need great mentors, mm. great coaches, great examples. Yeah. You know, this generation is lucky. Most adults want to be a mentor to somebody. They want to coach a younger person. Yeah. They are happy and willing so to do. Sometimes you even have social media. You can follow some people even without necessarily encountering them. Mm -hmm. So we have many more avenues to build into ourselves good habits. And I think that the good habits will determine what your output will be eventually. Yeah. So if you can imbibe these things. But let me leave you with one thing that I use very, very carefully. Okay. Fear God. Be the best of yourself. Remember that we are not who we are because we are perfect. And above all, note also that in everything that you do, it will impact someone either negatively or positively. If you know that it will not give any good impact, then why do you bother? But be sure to be knowledgeable. Ghana experience. Get some expertise. Be good at something, even if it's one thing. Be yeah. very good at it. So that everybody knows that, oh, when it comes to this person, you are the person this is to it. call. That's yeah. about it. So I think that we are all learning and eventually we'll get there. We've spent an hour chatting <laughs> and I think it's been very insightful. Thank you for giving us a little window into your life and the work that you do. Ladies and gentlemen, viewers, Ghana, the world, <laughs> thank you for sticking with us. My conversation on AM Exclusive was with aide to former president John Dramani Mahama, Joyce Bauer Motsgari.
Thank you so much. Thank you, madam. The name is simple. It's Moktaris. Moktari. Moktari. Yes. Yes. Thank Moktari. you. Mm -hmm. All right. There's still more to come on the AM show. Do not change that dial. Thank you for watching. Sorry to cut you, but I wanted to get your ex personal experience with the secretariat, if you scholarship secretariat, like your experience with the application process and how the outcome of it. Oh, so my the application, I think my boss at the time, he, he sent me the link. It was a WhatsApp message. This these opportunities are has open. I should try and apply. So that's why I heard about the get get uh, so not get from the scholarship secretariat so, so they they send a link either you you see you apply through that link and send some emails or you send hard copies of your documents to an office in accra so i did both i did the online application and also have somebody send my documents to the office in accra never heard anything from them no rejection letter nothing and i I qualified to to have been given. Uh, I mean, I, I graduated with a first class on this. My transcript was good. I had a viable research plan and research uh, proposal, which I had used to even gain admission to the University of Cape Coast to do a master. So it just, I don't know. They never got back to me. The story, what I got back was people who went there, some student leaders who had uh, some connections that got to the scholarship so one of them came to tell me so boy yeah, go, mm, paper, so I have, yeah. but how much did the the program cost the fees was four thousand yeah you see see my four thousand cities four thousand Ghana cities yes it was four thousand cities and at the time now I can see it's a new scar, but 2020, I was in very serious issue that I needed that. This is local. This is also local. This is also local. This is foreign. This is right. This is local. Local as well. So I think we should start with this. We should focus on this one. It's just a single one. Yeah. Fifty thousand. Let's check one. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, so nice portfolio. Seems like someone who is well accomplished. Mm -hmm. And oh, okay. It says here too that he was appointed to the board of. The National Health Insurance Authority in 2017. Wow. This guy can certainly not be an NDP. He's not an NDP. <laughs> he doesn't, his portfolio. You have to be a Ghanaian 
and you should have gained an admission into an accredited institution, whether locally or abroad. This, this was a question I asked during my orientation in 2017. When they were taking me through the kind of selection process, and I asked, they, they mentioned need, 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 a person has to be a needy person, this, this, this. So I asked, ah, how do you sit in Accra? And they tell me who a needy person is. Uh, who a needy person is, where the person resides, in, let's say, uh, up north or far east. Do you, do you use Voodooism? <laughs> and I realized that it was more based on experience than a more rigorous uh, system. So I began developing a decentralization process. So I know you might have heard. I was the first to introduce the scholarship decentralization application or selection system. I think that is the most unfortunate way to describe who deserves a scholarship. Because we know that we live in a society where some have and some don't have. So we speak about the haves and the have-nots. And in every society, it is always the collective thinking that opportunities be provided for those who don't have to also be able to survive, thrive, and contribute their quota. And so scholarships should be targeted at them. So when you just say, as you have said, that all you need to be a Ghanaian and to be able to provide evidence of admission, and that should be a basis for you to get a scholarship. I reject that definition because that then creates room for an abuse of the scholarship scheme itself. So there's always a tie rope between meritocracy and need. Who is the Ghanaian? And how do you describe a needy person under the Ghanaian dispensation? If you want to go by the matrix or the standard of, let's say, we describing public servants as the middle class, it, it becomes very cagey because, because you know very well how much the middle class is paid. So if you say that we want to go by that criteria or what matrix are we going to measure need apart from the ones that usually will come from recommendations or things that we usually cite on social media. And at times you can also get recommendations from uh, opinion leaders or people of influence within the social value chain. So the clergy, the media, traditional authorities, and politicians. People who are beneficiaries of those How? Can you, can you show me that? Because, because, because hardly will you have one person doing two programs at the same time. We have confirmed some. One person doing two programs, two different programs. at the same time. Because subsequent years. Yes. So the person get, 2019 gets a scholarship mm -hmm. and then 2020 gets a scholarship. Okay. Then if the person has completed and there's a need for further and we are awarded, we can award. But even with the example that we give you, she, poly, uh, she got two scholarships in the same year. The same year? Yes, and even with this one. Who is this? I don't call her. That's the name. And then the name is here. Again. In the same year. Oh, what if they are twins? The same name. The twins, same twins, twins, twins bear the same name. So, <clears throat> okay, so this can happen. It is possible, see, this is North Carolina. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this way. University of Hertfordshire. UK. Mm -hmm. so, it, so, so it means that that is not even possible. So how is that the same person? Then you, you are having a data, mm -hmm. but, but the data is not the source. Okay, it is possible that we, we, we might have extracted this for you. 
problem. Okay, so maybe there could have been a problem with the extraction. But there's more than one. It doesn't matter, sweetheart. What I'm saying to you is that one person cannot be in North Carolina and be the same time in the UK. Well, if one completes one and then pursues another one and is going to add value, that's different. But where you are giving double scholarship, uh, I don't think we, we allow, the law allows us to receive double pay or double salary. The Auditor General will not allow that. Similarly, you cannot receive double scholarship. And again, it boils down to priority. I mean, what is to what extent are these people, whatever scholarship we are giving for this double scholarship or double programs, going to bring or add to the Ghanaian economy? Yes, but I'm saying that if the person had done, let's say, completed a bachelor's program and wants to enroll. master's programs. Yes, it's possible. These are all requests from students. I've dealt with some. To me, as the one support, the one support to start their university education, they cannot afford it. That's just one example. There are several. This one is from a student who is visually impaired. Very brilliant. He has tried everything to get the Bursa South District Assembly to give him money from the disability component of the Common Fund. They have refused. He is supposed to do political science at the University of Ghana. He is still at home. He has gotten no help. And I'm doing my best to try and raise funds for him so that he can go and begin his degree program. These are the kinds of students who should be getting the scholarships. Students from poor families, poor backgrounds, demonstratedly so, and they are there. Instead of opening and allowing setting up offices and making people share their money for their families and loved ones. But there is nothing brilliant and needy about either get fund, GNPC, or, or, um, or scholarship secretariat. Welcome back on the AM show after that exciting conversation with uh, Joyce Bauer Mokhtari. But now we focus on scholarships and getting them in our motherland, Ghana. It would appear from what we've seen year after year that those who have no need of scholarships are the ones who often end up with them and that those who actually are in dire need do not, cannot, access these scholarships. What is the trend? Those who are politically connected, former TESCON members, CEOs, among others, are getting scholarships worth as much as $50,000 plus. In some instances, multiple scholarships. But the question is, should we go the way the D Director General of the Scholarship Secretariat uh, says we should go, have an act stipulating it, how about candidness or candor, honesty? We get into that conversation this morning 
as we look at that latest expose by the fourth estate, scholarships bonanza. We get into that conversation with Professor George Kwekutoku Odro. He's Professor of Educational Leadership at the University of Cape Coast. Prof, good morning. Yes, your audience. I would start from your initial reactions to this. This is not the first time we've had an expose like this, especially over the last eight years. But how did this strike you, this later saga? Well, um, and it is not surprising, not surprising because of the extreme politi politicization of the scholarship management, which in a way does not allow rules, criteria to determine who should or who should not get a scholarship. So from that perspective, I don't, I don't think that it's surprising. But it is worrying because scholarships are meant to support the need, those who do not have it, those who are in the area of critical need, critical programs, which the state needs. These are the people who should get scholarship. So when I can't saw that people who could buy six of mini buses for campaign purposes could have their children also benefiting from scholarship. Mm. When you do not get to eat, but are very brilliant, do not get it. Then there's unfairness. So I think that. It is unfair. It does not place into reality the justice and freedom which our nation seeks to uh, actually abide by. It raises issues of equity and also undermines the notion of equal opportunity. So it is unfair. That is what I can say. Where did this problem start? Is it from the standpoint, like you said, because once it's like some people would say, if you allow too much power uh, in the hands of an executive, you just might have someone who will come someday and then abuse that power. Did we not streamline enough from the outset in respect of our scholarships? Is this why we are here? What are the fundamental problems? Well, let, let's trace it back to independence, Kwame Nkrumah's day. Hmm. And Chroma provided scholarship, focusing on the needy. And that's the more reason if you take the rural, disadvantaged northern sectors, Nkrumah's concentration was on those people. Nkrumah put in strategy to ensure that critical skills that are needed could not be provided by the state if anyone has that. That is an exceptional case. That person could get scholarship. And that has gone on, of course. There were cases of the racism and others that came in here and there. But within the past eight years, this thing has become institutional. To the extent that I know people who have told me, look, I've been told that if I want a scholarship, I should provide this thing, I should provide card and all those things. And so it is the politicization of something that should have been very normal, that is creating the problem. That is where we trace it to. My brother, let me give you an example of myself. I was with the University of Cape Coast, and the universities have this staff development program. Now, educational leadership was a challenge in the country because we did not have people in that area with terminal degrees. My university nominated me, but then what we were told was that the cost was too much. They could not sponsor it. Others were also denied access to that. Fortunately, I got 
scholarship from Cambridge Commonwealth Trust. Mm. And so I had to go. But the scholarship was such that it could not cater for everything. So I had to apply to the university, and the university recommended me for the Ghana Government Scholarship. The award was granted. Now, when they got to know that I had gotten the Cambridge Scholarship, I was called and told that because I had gotten Cambridge Scholarship, it meant that I was in a capacity of benefiting from my education without government support. Mm. And that was withdrawn. The Ghana, Ghana Government Scholarship was withdrawn because of that. Which, which, which and, year was this? And that was 19... 1989. 1989, right. 1989. Now, was, what was done? At that point, I thought I had been cheated because, one, my background was very poor, but then I understood it. But once I have a support, support from another entity, then opportunity should be given to others who do not have it. I understood it that way. If that principle carried through, then we will find that the poor and those who really need the scholarship will be given. Mm. But it's not the case. Now it is purely a political party affair. And I think as a nation, we must stand against that, make scholarship a period operate need-based, so that those who need it will really have it. Whether I Look at some ministers. It came out, and I'm sure you have it. Some ministers who were going to Galilee for a program for themselves had to be sponsored with get fund money. Mm. When universities lack facilities to support even admission, people cannot be admitted. You know, so these are things that I think as a nation we must condemn. And if possible, those people who use their positions get scholarships for them. Well, we should bring one of them to book. Uh, and you that know, is... They're agreed. It is very greedy to see that someone who openly, we know, could buy mini passes mm. for campaign purposes to benefit from scholarships. Hmm. I don't think it is. Something and, that but but you see, the, the, the counter-argument, and we must really... I want us to address it rather than use a, look at the fluff that would always look at. Okay. They would tell you that these are also Ghanaians, are they not? Uh, and, what, ma what makes it, do you find it immoral and why? Because in your instance, and I, I completely understand, I have had friends who maybe um, were going to an institution that required that they pay about 30,000 plus uh, pounds or dollars or euros. And maybe they got funding from one end. And another end had said, if you have any other scholarship, we can't support you. Because then you would have two scholarships. In your mind, you would think, oh, but that would allow me to do it, adding both. But someone else will lose on your account. So being Ghanaian, whether they are MPs or ministers, what makes it immoral? Thank you. The, what makes it immoral is that we all pay taxes. And it is government responsibility to ensure that every tax gets the fundamental need survival. Yes. And so if men has used taxes advanced certain let's say, let me use the urban to advance urban centers. And you have been privileged to benefit from that thing, which somewhere in the rural area has not been able to benefit from. Then on that note, there's some fairness, that, that, that's the basis of it. Mm. So if there is the need for scholarship to support someone to contribute to bridging the gap, the focus should go to where uh, the, there is less endowment. That is where it should go to. Where there is it greater is, need. That is where it should go to. It is true that we are taxpayers. And my brother, let me tell you, that is the basis upon which the free SHS is suffering now. Because the argument was that 
the free must go for everybody because we are, we are all Christians. That was the argument. Now you come to realize that those who had the rich money, the free aspect of the program they are enjoying, the money they, they take is just it doesn't go into the education of the of, of the children. Yet those who come from deprived context context cannot even get money to buy simple books that they can they, they should they need to help them study well. So we find inequities in the system. It is a responsibility of government to ensure that there is equity. If government operates scholarship on the basis that everybody is a Ghanaian, then government is not responding to its responsibility of promoting equity. So that's the basis of which I think that I would draw my conclusion. That argument for me doesn't hold. It's immoral for me. It's immoral. Uh, I, will, I will break down into the different facets of this problem, but do you feel, because you made mention of Nkrumah, and of course this started all the way back in 1960, right? And I know of uncles, grand uncles among others who uh, traveled to the likes of Germany, Russia around that time because of uh, the thinking of Nkrumah. All of these people benefited, a lot of them came back and contributed uh, to the country, and it wasn't political. Have we then lost the plot, the essence of the scholarship, on, on the back of what you've heard over years, culminating in what we are discussing now? Have we lost the plot? We have totally lost it. Totally. Because there is a lot of people who have gone on government scholarship to pursue courses that universities in Ghana are running. Right. I know of people who have gone on scholarships to undertake professional development programs that benefit themselves, but not the institution in which they are working. But because connections, because of political party affiliations, they are able to get that. And so we have totally lost, we've missing the mark. We've really missed the mark as far as scholarship administration is concerned. And for me, I think that the scholarship secretariat needs to be overhauled. And when, when you say when you say overhauled, when you say overhauled, what do you mean? What specifically yeah. do you mean? Yeah. When I say it should be overhauled, I mean that we need to change the mode of uh, operation at a place. We need to watch who is appointed as the administrator. We do not appoint political extremists as administrators of the scholarship secretariat. Mm. We should get people who have national nationalistic orientation man that place. That is what I mean by the overhauling. We need a mindset, total mindset change as far as scholarship administration is concerned. And it has not even been at that level. Let me tell you, my brother, Comfort, you know Comfort yes. supports young girls, TD ones. I was sad when someone came to me complaining that she had been nominated for campaign award and that everything was okay, but eventually he couldn't get it. Yet another person whose status, I mean the father parents can easily get it, and got the, 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 the support. And the big question is, it's happening. But used me to operate that way. What is happening? So we need a mindset change. Mindset change that will focus on rural, less endowed, needy people where 
money should go to compared to those who already have money and can fend for themselves. I always cite myself as an example. I have benefited from two scholarships in this country. One, a cocoa board scholarship. My grandfather was a major cocoa farmer in what we now call the OT region. And this wasn't even through my senior secondary school days. It was at some point that it came on. And we had, you know, I got to benefit from this briefly. The second one was at the University of Ghana. I was in Spanish class. And of course, you had to be, you had to be one of the top, top, top candidates before you would get the government scholarship. So it wasn't even um, any grouping, you applying. It was basically your department submitting, submitting to the scholarship secretariat those who were the highest contenders or those who had you know, secured the highest scores. And then um, you would be selected to move forward. It was clear cut who would benefit. In this instance, you don't even get to know the, the processes. In fact, I'm looking at the scholarship secretariat's um, website, and it says its main programs and activities fall under the thematic area, human resource development, employment, and productivity, and under the Ghana Shared Growth and Development Agenda, and go four of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And it goes on and on. And it talks about need-based scholarships. And you ask yourself, where are the need-based people? In previous years, we've looked at lists with people who had no need. And they've been there. And the question is, how can we get here? The head of the scholarship secretariat says, we need a scholarships act. How urgently do we need this, if, if you agree with him, Prof? Well, um, the act is good, but only, only if the act wouldn't remain a paper. It is human beings who interpret it. If we take what you read website, if we were to go strictly by that, I'm sure the challenge we are talking about now, even if it will be there, it will be minimal. So we can have the act, we can prove it. But if we do not change the mindset, we will not change the mode of appointing scholarship administrators and staff to that safety place, the act will remain on paper cannot be translated into reality. Hold for so me, we Prof. Need, uh, we mm. also need mindset change. Right. Uh, just hold for me briefly. Let me bring in Professor Stephen Ade, um, Emeritus Professor. Uh, Prof, good morning. Good morning. It's good to have you join this, this conversation. You yourself had to benefit from certain uh, things to progress in education. You got scholarships. Uh, and some of them, I mean, you, you couldn't attend certain schools back in the day. But looking at scholarships, I just want to start from the start. 1960 and Nkrumah and everything that he did. And how we've ended up here, where scholarships are not going to the poor, but to those who can actually afford it. What do you make of it? First of all, there are always two types of scholarships. One is merit-based, and the other is means the third one. So I think that always in America and the Arab people, there are some people who they may be rich, but then will get a scholarship because of their service and service. And then there are those which are means tested. So also in that side you have the two. But you haven't distinguished them. And that sometimes it's where the trouble is in the sense that there must be a distinction between those which are purely competitive and those which are being tested. And when that is not that, then uh, confusions arise. 
We have these two groups, but at least as far as the scholarship secretariat is concerned, it focuses on need-based scholarships. And of course, there's the other end, like for my end, where it was more based on merit. But the need-based quotient, if you look at the facts, the figures, and those who are getting them, uh, former TESCON members, leaders of TESCON, the, the, the MPPs, tertiary arm, um, CEOs, people who show clearly that they do not have this need. And you look at the quantum of money involved, in some instances as much as $50,000 plus. When you have very needy, very brilliant young people, some from rural areas trying to make a headway, and they can't get these same scholarships, per what the fourth estate is telling us, uh, are we then getting it right or are we losing the plot? First of all, I'm not sure that uh, the scholarship secretary is going to operate a deep based scheme. I don't know about it. But it stands to reason that if there are two people and one is able to afford it, then it's consideration. But I don't think that formally the scholarship secretary operates a need based scheme. Number one. Number two, of course. We have had a problem for many years, which gets worse in the years, whereby this idea of protocol, and by means of protocol, we are talking about privilege, either by status, political connection, money, or whatever it is. And I think that that is a pain of Ghana in the sense that now the political and class, especially, and those who have made it, or have benefited from the system are now making themselves a class to even benefit more. And that is unfortunate because it is now making the deprived more deprived because of that. And it is on there in admission to secondary schools uh, and all of them. So it is an unfortunate phenomenon which has become part, almost part of our system. And it especially becomes even more crucial a topic. I have a message here from a gentleman who says, I personally applied for the same scholarship, went through the processes, because sometimes we think it's all international, Cambridge and all of that, local ones. I personally applied for the same scholarship, went through processes successfully, but they didn't pay the fee. So this person was offered the scholarship. 2020 to 2021 at the Takrade Technical University Plumbing and Gas Technology at the Faculty of Built and Natural Environment. I am a victim. I wrote back to the Secretariat, copied the District Assembly and the Western Regional Minister. Nothing came out of it. I applied with a second class APA at TTU. Then you look at the situation of the lady whose story uh, the Fourth Estate shared. And here she was rural part of Ghana, made it excellent grades at university, wanted to further her studies. She was, the, the board was thrilled with her presentation. She was practically through. And then when, after a while, she didn't hear from the secretariat, went there and she was told that, oh, there's protocol and MPs and ministers will bring in this and that from different places. And so protocol had to take uh, uh, precedence. When the Secretariat says on its page, it's there to build manpower for, for our e economy. I don't get it, but then how do we save our scholarships beyond the act? How do we do it? Well, first of all, that means clarify two things which I don't want to be associated with. The fact that somebody told her that she was on the list is not something that one can vouch. Because, uh, it's a corridor, a corridor talk. So it, it, there's no evidence to that effect. But the issue that this thing is happening, that the, the, those vulnerable are being denied despite their achievements and the rest are true. And I think that something must be done about it. And Society must rise against this phenomenon. Prof. Somebody was suggesting that there should be a law. I don't think that the law will make a difference. It has to do with 
making the system transparent, those who apply, those who were awarded, must be published. And this is the type of information that I expect the media people to be insisting upon because of the effect of the information, the information bill. I think that this thing must be made public and then we can name and shame people who are doing those things. So long as we don't do that. So I don't think the legal issue that must be uh, transparency and publishing the, all, all those who get the scholarship to be published. And the, the media people can help greatly by insisting that that is done. And then when we see it as people are alleging play and other people, ministers and other things having their children then, then the Ghanaian public will react. So, so okay. Prof. Day, you, you say they, they must be punished. Uh, there's a reason we are not putting out names this morning. The fourth estate has already put out names. A former IGP's daughter, a CEO, this person, that person. Uh, we, we all know those people. But do you think as part of that punishment, people in power, people who have the resources, who go through these systems and benefit from need-based scholarships, need-based scholarships, should they be made to pay back, do you think? Well... Technically, first of all, they should be funded. We said they will be shamed. I think that later you cannot do anything at all because so long as the scholarship is not means tested and they are Ghanaians, you cannot do anything about it. These are the type of things when it's a naming and shaming and hope. But uh, I don't think that they have done something illegal. They have been immoral, and that is a different one. Uh, you cannot punish them for that. I mean, for example, we believe it that my son went to take and I volunteered. And my friend was the vice chancellor. I was then rector of Impact. But I said that I would like to pay for him. And I paid for my son while he was even entitled to a government scholarship. So it's a moral issue. And I'm wondering whether on a moral issue you can punish or take the people to court. Then that is not the... I think that when they are, the list is published, in fact, if they know that the list will be published, there are some people who will not even go for it. Prof. <laughs> Well, they still go for it. And, and, and of course, you've seen some of the names in the past, members, prominent members of parliament, ministers, and people who walk the corridors of power and those connected uh, to them. Any final words, Prof, if you have... Uh, well, they are, they, I would say that they are alleged. That's why the court of state should go for the list of public The thing is that in Ghana, we are not naming and shaming people. And that is why these things are done... Uh, quietly, this is, uh, has come out because the people of uh, this girl have spoken up. But I think it's unfortunate that the spirit that we had in Ghana, whereby the rich care for the poor, seems to be lost. And the rich are looking to be richer. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. But this is not a legal issue, it's a moral issue. And moral issues must be counted by moral repugnance rather than being a shame. Thank you, Prof, uh, for having joined this all important conversation. We're grateful for your time. Uh, that is Professor Stephen Ade, uh, Professor Emeritus. And we were also joined by Professor George Kweku Tokuodru, uh, Professor of Educational Leadership, University of uh, Cape Coast. This conversation, well, it's out there now, it's up to you. Does it make any sense how we're administering these scholarships? The head says, legislate on it. Let's have a scholarship act. But when you have a visually impaired student striving for academic excellence, and that person will not get it, and a fully abled uh, person in different contexts, well-to-do, will get it, then I guess at some point we have to sit down as a country and ask ourselves whether we're doing the right thing. Stay with us on The AM Show. We'll be back with more.
So it's time now for us to talk about some lucky winnings, a raffle, that if you indulge or participate in, you're likely to win a house. The brothers who are in charge of this venture are in the studio with me. And interestingly, we are going by first name basis. We have Dan, Will, and Jay. Gentlemen, welcome to the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you feeling? Yeah, yeah, great. Do you get compliments a lot about, you know, looking alike? All three of you. Yeah, we've heard triplets, yeah. twins. <laughs> twins yeah. 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 I can't see it personally, but... <laughs> yeah? yeah? Well, so let's talk about Tramway, but Jiwufie, that's the name of um, this project, right? Jiwufie. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about yourselves first and why you are in Ghana doing this Jiwufie um, house project. Dan? So we are Ghanaians by heritage, um, born and raised in the UK. Um, it started off in the UK where essentially I had a house that I couldn't sell and it was taking a very long time, more than 12 months and then the pandemic happened okay. and the housing market was closed so I couldn't do anything with the house and it was costing me a lot of money um, and I needed to find a way to get rid of the house and God revealed that I need to give the house away. But I just God needed, revealed? Yeah. Okay. I prayed and it, it was like a revelation, give it away. Okay. Um, but I needed to find a way to give it away without putting myself in too much debt. So after much research, I was kind of led on this path of give it away in a competition. So I did the first one in the UK. The tickets were only two pounds and it worked. Okay. I managed to sell enough tickets to be able to give away a house. So that first competition, a pregnant lady who was just about to get married won. Um, and then my brothers joined me and we've been doing it for the last four years. We've given away over four million pounds worth of property. Wow. Um, over 150,000 pounds in cash prizes on top of that as well. Mm. And the reason why we are here in Ghana is because this is where we're from. There's nothing yeah. better than helping our own people, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. So, yeah. That's why you're here in Ghana now, back home. Back home. Um, give a house to one lucky winner. Amazing. But Will, tell me a little bit more about this Jiwufie venture. What are the details? How does someone um, enter the, the draw, the competition? Yeah. How does so, it work? So Jiwufie is a property competition. Okay. Um, so entrants need to be over the legal age of 18 to be able to enter. That's okay. the first thing. Uh, there's two methods of entry. So you can dial a code, star 714 star 848 hash, and then you'll be going through the prompts and you, you can easily uh, purchase tickets uh, through that route. Uh, second route is via the website, which is jewelfear.com, mm. and you can purchase tickets through the, through the website. Okay, so Dal, I want to try it now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we can show you how that works on the phone. Star what? So Dal, star, star, star 714. 714. Star. Star. 848. 848. Hash. Hash. Yeah. And it'll take me to... Oh, okay. Am I above 18? Yes. Yeah. Buy raffle tickets. Am I going to have to pay for it? <laughs> you, are, you are, unfortunately. Okay. So one ticket I is hope I win. Pounds. Yeah. Okay. Well, you've got three so options. You've got, got you've got three options to choose from. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll show you the, the details on camera later on, but let's get the conversation going. Mm -hmm. yeah. How much total is going into this um, dual fear draw? What's the total money you're going to give away? So we're giving house? away... Oh, sorry. Yeah, so uh, total cash prize is uh, 150,000 US dollars. So um, just, to be, well, just to be clear, uh, the uh, successful winner doesn't have to spend the entire 150,000 uh, to purchase the property. If, for example, they find a property up to, I don't know, 100K, we will transfer the remaining balance of 50K to that individual. Right. So... Well, there's a school of thought that mm. in these draws, mm -hmm. sometimes you make more money than you put out. So because people are buying tickets, how do you ensure that you are being transparent, you're maintaining integrity mm -hmm. in the processes of you know, this draw, Dan? So firstly, we are registered with the NLA. Okay. So they have full visibility of everything that we are doing. They're the regulatory body for lotteries and, and raffles in, in this country. Um, they are the ones that are actually going to be conducting the draw itself, so it's completely out of our hands. We're just the ones that are selling the tickets. 
and then we collect all the ticket numbers and then we give it to them and then they are the ones that will actually do the prize draw itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when, um, when is the draw going to happen? The last week of June. Okay, so that's some time. Yes. Last week. So from now till June, people yep. can buy tickets Absolutely. and yep. register. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so if you had the chance to convince our audience to come aboard, what would you say, Will? I mean, this is a great opportunity, guys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to become your own landlord, this is your chance. I know we know, we understand how difficult it is to, uh, to acquire a property here, to become a homeowner. Um, and for many people, they wouldn't be given any kind of opportunity. So this is, uh, this is a great in initiative um, for you guys to get involved with. So yeah, like I said, uh, dial the code star 714 star 848 hash uh, and go through the instructions to purchase your tickets. You have three options. Uh, alternatively, you can go to the website, which is dualfear.com, and you can purchase tickets uh, via that, that way as well. All right, so now I want to actually try it for our audience to see how it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if the camera can see from where I am. Star 714, star. What hash? 848 eight hash. 848 eight hash. Oh, yeah. hold on a second. I have to do that again. Star 714. One four star yeah. eight four eight eight, eight hash. hash. Yeah. This is how you enter the draw for uh, the Jufia raffle. So it says, "Welcome to Jufia raffle. Buy a ticket." And how much is one ticket? Thirty Ghana cities. Thirty Ghana yeah. cities. Yeah. But then, if you want to buy, how more, many? We'll give yeah. You so if you want to buy five, you can buy it for a hundred. Or if you want to buy ten, you can buy it for one hundred and fifty. So he said, thank you for purchasing. I think they'll send me um, an, S okay, an SMS yeah. or USSD for me to enter my password. Mm. Okay. I'm not going to show you guys. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> right. So um, is this more like a corporate social responsibility thing for you? I know it started as a way of giving out a house you couldn't sell. Mm. But now that you've been doing this for four years, and I'm sure you all have individual business. Or is this the business? This is the business, but we're also in property as well. Okay. Um, but just to go back to your point about corporate social responsibility, the reason why it has worked so well in the UK is because there is a housing crisis there. Okay. And it's the reason why it's gone viral. People have, are seeing this now as another means to get onto the property ladder. Yeah. And it's difficult in London to buy a home. But I know how difficult it is here in Ghana. It's near enough impossible. Mm. If you don't come from money, you don't have a really good job. It's, it's hard, you know. The interest rates here are crazy. To get a mortgage here is crazy. So this is why we're doing this. Yeah. If someone wanted to reach out to you, how do they contact you? So we have a WhatsApp number right. that they can reach out to. If I can just let you know what that is. So it's 0538611417. That's 0538611417. Four one seven. Our the customer numbers support will be put on the screen for audience to. You are going to say something. Our customer support is available there on WhatsApp, um, but we can also be reached on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at Jiwufie. Um, they can reach us also on the website where we've got an email address there as well. Okay, so one more time. The number is zero five three eight six one one four one seven. I'll say it again. Zero five three eight six. 11417. How are you getting the house that you're going to give away? Are you building it? Are you going to buy an already existing house and renovate no. it? Will, how does it work? Well, uh, the lucky winner yeah. will get to choose to purchase. Oh, you choose yes. what house the, the you win want? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So the winner gets to choose, and there isn't any restriction uh, in terms of area. So the, the person can win, can purchase um, in the north, east, south, or west uh, of Ghana. Um, they can choose an, a bungalow to a house to whatever. But it uh, just has to be within the budget of $150,000. Exactly. Yeah. But like I said, obviously, if they don't spend up to the, the maximum, we will transfer the remaining balance in cash to that individual as well. You guys are a generous bunch. So now, <laughs> how, do, how do I ensure, because I'm, I'm going to enter the draw, how do I ensure that I win? <laughs> That's my final question to you. you, need how, to, you need how do to, I make sure that I win? Because I want to win a house. You need to buy many, as many tickets as you possibly okay. can to increase your odds. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's a game so of chance. So buy more and stand a chance to win. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, take, I'll give you each 30 seconds to say some final words before we wrap it up, starting with you, Dan. 
for me, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You know, can you imagine you never have to worry about rent, paying bills towards your house ever again. Any income that you get goes straight to you. You can use that to invest. You can use that to live, you know. We're not here just to pay bills. God doesn't put us here just to pay bills. We're here for a purpose, for a reason. So with this opportunity, you can alleviate yourself from not having to think about rent or a mortgage ever again. It's life changing. It's life changing. Yeah, exactly. Jay. Will, sorry. Will. So just, yeah, so just, just to echo what Dana said, uh, this provides you with uh, financial freedom. So, it, you know, if you're thinking about generational wealth, this could be the mark or the beginning of something, you know, uh, you know significant. Yeah. So, guys, this is, this is a great opportunity for you to get involved with, you know, if you've been struggling, if you've been paying a lot of rent, um, if you're struggling with, you know, uh, your housing situation, this could be your chance. And Jay? Um, I would say anything or any type of property that you've ever dreamed of uh, owning, uh, this is the opportunity to do so. Um, it's an amazing opportunity. It's a tried and tested um, you know, um, model that we've, um, we've obviously adapted in uh, London and the UK, and it's worked magnificently, and we want to help as many of our own people uh, over here. So yeah, get okay. involved, get involved. So there you have it, the Jiwufie. Um, draw and just to reiterate, there's a national lottery authority that's spearheading this. You're only Absolutely. facilitating um, yeah. the actual uh, draw, but Correct. it's, it's yeah. NLA that's in charge of doing it. So feel free if you want to enter and stand a chance to win a house for free. You can uh, buy a ticket either by dialing the short code on your screens or by logging on to their website also on your screens right now to purchase a, a, tic a ticket. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Hopefully by June, um, you come back and tell us who won. Absolutely. And hopefully yes, it'll be please. me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Dan, Will, and Jay yes, from yes. Trapway or Tramway. In the UK, it's Tramway, and in Ghana, we're Jiwufie. Yeah. Why not Tramway all through? Because we want it to be a bit more relating. Yeah, yeah you know. okay. It makes Jiwufie, sense. Jiwufie, get your house. So Jiwufie, mm, thank you, yeah. gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much right. for having us. I wish you all thank the very best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Right, there's still more to come on the AM show. Benjamin and I will be back to wrap it up properly like we always do. Please, do it. For the final belt of the show today, we are going to talk about a steady abroad fair from Excel Plus um, company. My guest in the studio, Nana Bonsu, right? And Joseph Redu. Kwenu. Kwenu, Joseph Kwenu. Can you tell me a little bit about this Excel Plus project? What is it really about? Yeah, so Excel Plus, we're an organization we okay. focus on educational abroad. Um, so we, are, we specifically focus on counseling students, giving them the right information on how to study abroad. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, people want to go abroad to study different destinations. So we currently work with different partners all across the United States, United Kingdom, Ireland, Dubai, Malaysia to help students go study abroad. Okay, there are a lot of other agencies like that that yeah. help students study abroad, exchange yeah. programs. What makes yeah. you different? What sets you apart from the lot? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say that uh, what sets us apart is that um, at Excel Plus, first of all, we don't charge for any of our services. Oh. We provide our services for free because the aim is to help students, you know, get the right information, get the right services to be able to, you know, um, pursue their dreams abroad. And then secondly, we are also a British Council approved organization. So um, we are regulated. We have proper strategic contracts and partnership with our universities out there. So anybody that comes to us is safe. So because we are not charging you, we are providing you with the information for free. We are okay. guiding you through the processes for free as well. So when you say it's for free, means that the processes of assisting these individuals to acquire yes. um, travel documents and all that is free. But mm -hmm. they would have to pay for the documents, the school fees. And yeah, all definitely. Um, 
pay for your school. You have to clarify because someone might think that everything is for free. No. Okay. You have a program coming up at Accra City Hotel this uh, Friday. Yeah. Correct. Tell me about that. Yeah, for sure. So I think one, one thing to just mention is uh, Joseph and I, between us, have extensive um, experience in education. Okay. I've, I've worked at two of the top 100 universities in the United States. Uh, Joseph has been uh, long standing here in the Ghana community. Um, and so what we decided to do was have our study abroad fair. Um, in this fair, we're bringing about 11 different schools, uh, some from the UK, some from the US. Um, and they're going to be showcasing to students on why they should study at the university. Okay. Um, so it's going to give students a really good chance to meet the universities, ask their questions, and then and in turn, we will help them with processing to make sure that they arrive at the university. Would they be, would they be recruiting there at the fair? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So who should come or who can come? And when mm -hmm. coming, what should they come with? Yeah, good question. Yeah. Good Joseph, question. <laughs> really good question. So uh, this fair is for anybody who is done with your um, WASI, your high school you know, um, education, and you want to pursue your bachelor's degree outside, or you are done with your master's, uh, you want to pursue a PhD, or even done with your undergraduate studies and also want to pursue um, your master's degree education. This is for you. You can come over with your you know, certificates and transcripts, and then you can even get on the spot admission if you meet the entry requirement for the program that you want to you know, apply for. Okay. So it's open to the general public. Even if you're a working professional and you want to you know, further your studies yeah. you know, in your field of uh, uh, work, you can also come along. It's, it's from 12 to 5 p.m. So at lunch break, you can quickly you know, dash through and then see what information you can get before you know you go back to work so okay. it's open to the general public okay yeah. is the fair also free do you have to register or just show up it's actually free okay. it's free to the public but then you have to register ah. um at our website that's www.xlplusonline.com xlplusonline.com okay. Okay. okay you can also um send us a whatsapp uh, on 0246-725-909 Please take that again and Zero. slowly now. <laughs> <laughs> so you can also WhatsApp us okay. at 0246 725 909 and then we can help you with the registration. You can also show up, maybe you are not, you know, internet savvy or anything yeah. of that sort. You can still come for the event, we'll register you at the front desk and then you can join, you know, the, the, the conference. So you can How long register. have you both been doing this? So I have worked in education for 15 years. Um, I was, I started my journey at uh, University of Massachusetts in, in Massachusetts, and then I was also at George Mason University. Okay. Um, so I've been doing that as a, I was a director of international recruitment for about 15 years. Oh, so that's where the experience is yeah. from, Correct. recruitment. Yeah. Okay, but this one, Excel Plus Online, yeah. how long has this been going on? So this, yeah. Excel has been in existence for about five years. Okay. Um, last year we had a fair, similar thing in Accra and in Kumasi. Mm -hmm. But this year, we are only having the fair in Accra. Okay. So it's going to be a big one. So but, OK, do you have offices here? In that, where, where are you located? Yeah, our office is at Jolu. OK. And then we also have one office in Kumasi at Sahuju. Um, it's at Atinga Junction, next to the Day Spring Community School. And also in Accra, it's at Jolu, next to the Jolu Junior High School. Yeah. Okay, so in case someone misses the fair, they can still reach you. They can still come, you, yeah. over uh, to, come our to your offices. Yes. And, okay. yeah. So this is your chance to reach out to our audience to invite them to the fair. Mm -hmm. You can look into your camera and sure. do that. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, we like to definitely invite everybody. I think um, you know, one, of the, one of the passions that I do, why, the reason I do this is because we want to make sure that we get right information to people about study abroad. Uh, there's a lot of various universities out there that really give really great opportunities. Uh, some of our institutions give 50% tuition discounts to students. Um, others do various things. So please come, get to meet the university reps, ask your questions, um, and really learn the right information because there's so much misinformation about going abroad to study and we want to make sure that we give you the right information. So please come meet us. Joseph and I will be there um, and we look forward to definitely helping you all. Joseph, you have 30 seconds to add your voice to that. <laughs> well, I say come for this event because you might not know what information you will get that will help you, you know, make an informed decision that will, you know, transform your career. So you may be qualified for something, but if you don't make a move, you might not know and not get the information. So don't sit at home. We invite everybody to pass through and then come and have an experience of your lifetime. Yeah. Well, so there you have it, the Steady Abroad Fair 2024 at Accra City Hotel this Friday from 12 to 5 p.m., correct? That's yeah. correct. Right. It's a chance for you to meet many universities from 
abroad, you yes. know, America, UK, UK all America, those Ireland, all over. And um, did, you didn't say though, should they come with their certificates or That's anything? Question. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So typically, a lot of universities want you to bring your transcripts. Okay. Um, that way, they can review your results. So if you if you studied, maybe if you're doing high school and you have your YEC results, bring them with you. If you've done an SAT, bring that with you. Um, if you're going for postgraduate degrees, bring your transcript. Okay. Um, maybe hopefully a, a copy of your your passport bio page because you could actually do your applications right there as well. Right. So bring anything that you have with you that is education qualified. So if you're looking for the chance to study abroad, this might just be your chance. Thank you, Nana Bonsu and Joseph, for Thank passing you. through. And I wish you the very best come Thank Friday you. in sure. your fair. Thank, Thank you. All Appreciate right. It. I'll come and see you back though so that you give me admission. <laughs> no problem at all. No problem. All right. So <laughs> that's the end of it. But Ben and I are coming back to wrap this up for you in a bit. Stay with us. And it's the end of the AM show for today, Thursday. But before we go, I want to say a big thank you to Akosia Kanga for this lovely outfit and wish a happy birthday to my cousin, Gift um, Esinamjila. Happy birthday. I wish you many, many successes in all your endeavors. Benjamin, how was today? I'd like to thank God for life. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a yeah, good yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. That was a good one with uh, Joyce Bauer Mokhtari. Yeah, thank and, you. Um, I'm still wrapping, trying to wrap my mind around the whole bit about scholarships and everything in between. I still don't get it, but it's a conversation we can have. Yeah. I've still been delving into the fourth estate's um, you know, expose and those who are getting scholarships versus those who, they who need them. Benjamin, they don't need them. We, we, we have serious problems as a country. That's where I'll leave it. That's where I'll leave it. But uh, we continue again tomorrow. Um, let's see what happens then. Hopefully one day we wake up in this country will be as good as, if not as good, will be bearable. Actually, it will not. <laughs> now let's, it will let's take be optimistic. Us. No, no, no. Let's we, be optimistic. we can't just think it will get there. Yeah. We must make it get there. Well, we'll see you again tomorrow from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. We are your host, Suti Abochi. And Benjamin Akapo, up next, join News Desk. Do stay for that. I think I'm going to be blowing kisses now. Thank you.